Scapegoat Podcast, a podcast series featuring the discussion of many different topics, flaws and all, based on personal whims and fascinations. Hosted by me, David Blake Fagiani, and several different guests. Welcome to episode 15 of the Escape Goat podcast. Uh, I've had a bit of a summer break, so I'm a little bit rusty, so bear with me. Um, but I'm uh, welcoming back uh, a guest who's had plenty of podcast experience, so he should be able to, uh, to carry it for me. Um, this is my brother, Matt. How are you doing? Hey, dude. Thank you very much for having me. You've been busy, haven't you? Uh, I've been fairly busy, um, but not with podcasting. <laughs> I've been putting out some, some filler material to see us through those arid summer months. Well, it's, it's, you've given the impression of someone who is podcasting constantly, so that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been, I've been, you know, trying to trying to hit that sort of self imposed um, one episode every two weeks. Um, you know, after the first six episodes came out once every week, that was a that was definitely unsustainable for sanity. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a shame you can't uh, keep up the momentum. But it's uh, you know, with, with being your own editor as well, it's kind of uh, it does take up a lot of time. Yeah, well, what I'm waiting for is the, is the sort of you know fame, uh, which which will allow me to uh, guest star on other people's podcasts all the time and not have to do any of the editing. You know, that's going to be great. Uh, yeah, because then you literally don't have to do anything. You just just yeah, talk. just t- turn up, <laughs> turn, turn up and leave. Uh, yeah. yeah, as as the talent. Yeah. <laughs> It's like this. I've just discovered recently that this is like totally the perfect occupation for me. Uh, if I could make it a full time occupation, because it's literally just chatting the normal shit that I always chat, but just sticking a mic in front of it. Yeah, it's kind of you've kind of got that made then. If you can, you know, monetize that in, in any way at all. Yeah, yeah. What a skill. <laughs> yeah, what a skill. Um, I I was actually thinking because because it felt you know I'm trying to sort of stagger guests, particularly returning guests on on, on the podcast um, for for expertise and uh, you know gender and, and 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 other qualifications and stuff. Um, but but I was determined to have you back. But I, I I one of the reasons I didn't have you back before is it felt like you'd been on relatively recently when we did our Meet the Feebles uh, All About Eve podcast. But we actually I was looking at my calendar and we actually recorded that back in uh, the end of May. No. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I know. That's May, June, July, August. So that's four months ago. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, summer's gone pretty quick in some ways, hasn't it? Even though it's been a really bizarre one. Yeah, someone put it. It's um, been the qu- the quickest year and the slowest year ever, like at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I think I said something similar. I was saying to someone like everything's been either like every single plan, per, you know, personal or, or macro or you know, public and everything. Everything's been either massively, massively accelerated or indefinitely delayed. Nothing, nothing's on track. You know, nothing's yeah. nothing's happened to schedule at all. Uh, speaking of which, um, Nia De Costa's Candyman has just been delayed uh, until 2021, but with no release date, which is super disappointing because it was moved uh, originally from uh, a June release date to Halloween, which I thought would be fantastic. And mm. uh, now it's just been put off pretty much indefinitely. So um, that's uh, really disappointing because I was really looking forward to a Candyman sequel this year. Yeah, well, I was looking forward to chatting with you about it. And uh, yeah, for anyone checking out, we'll plug this at the end, by the way, but uh, for anyone uh, checking out, uh, Matt does do a YouTube show with um, his, his uh, professional partner, Mike, uh, Matt and Mike, Paul Focus. And you covered the original Candyman, didn't you, last uh, last year? We did, yeah, because we went to see a screening of it uh, back-to-back with Hellraiser. 
at uh, one of the uh, Grim Up North um, Manchester screenings, uh, whatever, I can't remember what the name of it is, but anyway, and it was uh, just a fantastic thing. It was brilliant to see it projected, and the sound was incredible, and it just made me appreciate it uh, even more than I already did, and I'm a huge, huge fan of it. Uh, so yeah, to have uh, the potential of seeing a sequel in, like, you know, a month was, was really, really exciting, but... Uh, and as we were just saying uh, off mic before, you know, they must have, you know, if, if, if a horror movie can't be released on Halloween and make money, that's a really, really bad sign at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, well, they've, they've pushed, um, you know, they pushed Wonder Woman 84 back to Christmas, um, which, you know, I guess they're trying to get like what's left of the traditional sort of Christmas, uh, post-Christmas family cinema going market. Yeah, uh, but I don't. I don't know how much you know. I think how much that will exist this year is kind of a bit theoretical at the moment. I've got high hopes for that film. I really, really liked the original. It was actually one of my like preferred. Well, it's certainly the best of the DC movies uh, released in the last decade. <laughs> to be fair, uh, but um, yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like it's. Uh, I don't know how great a cinema experience is even going to be. That's the thing, really. You know, with the social distancing and the mask wearing, I don't know if it's actually going to be like you know a, a pleasant thing to do. I mean, like I support. I really hope that they manage to get the cinemas back on the feet. But you know, in terms of actually it being a good experience, I really don't know. Mm. Well, the, the Prince Charles Cinema in London, which you know, obviously we both visited a few times um, in our life, uh, that's that's reopening in autumn. In fact, I think it's reopening a, a little bit earlier than they planned it, for, but to be part of a film, a London Film Festival in September, late uh, September. Right. But then they're reopening as a you know the nearest to their regular programming in, in mid October, and they're, they're showing. I think they're starting with a showing of the uh, screening of two thousand and one. Oh, brilliant! Which is nice. What a good start. And yeah. then uh, American Werewolf as well. They're playing, aren't they? I noticed sometime in November. Was it? Doing an, yeah, an Alien Aliens double bill, I think, oh, uh, nice. as well. Yeah, all stuff we'd enjoy. <laughs> but, uh, Have you ever seen Werewolf at the cinema? Um, no, no, I've not. Yeah, it's proper good. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, I thought that might be your opinion. Um, anyway, um, I should uh, I should get round to the actual subject matter uh, of, of this podcast that I've invited you on for, and it, it's actually a bit of background that this is a weird um finally we're finally reaching this because because when i when i decided to do what i'd only then recently named the scapegoat podcast i i gathered matt together and we were going to have an, uh, another guest daniel on who's who, who was on episode 11 talk about roald Dahl. um but th- yeah so this was intended to be the first episode of the scapegoat podcast um and i decided to talk about uh this show uh because partly because i thought it was an interesting uh, cure its egg you know because it's not um it, it's a it's a subject of some passion for me which i'll hopefully communicate but it, it's by no means considered to be generally a, a success um except in the fact that it spawned a hugely you know canonical and, and uh popular and beloved franchise but but you know that, that the, the reason i want to talk about that is i think there's always a bit there's always more to say about flawed creations than there is to you know when you're just rhapsodizing about something you complicatedly love and, and generally people adore you know so, so that 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 thing is the first series of Black Adder. So, the Black Adder uh, that aired during nineteen eighty three, and and I wanted to talk to Matt about that partly because we have a you know shared upbringing. Uh, so Matt will have some slightly different but but similar memories to me of of, of how we came to it, um, and also because Black Adder, in general, is such a a, a central British institution, you know, and, and one one that became very important in British culture, kind of as as me and Matt were children, you know, and and, and has become, you know, it hasn't lost much of that luster, I think, despite its its aging. Um, so do you? Because I'll I'll get into this as well, Matt. But do you remember seeing? Um, do you remember your first memories of Blackadder in general? And do you remember your first memories of seeing the first series? I mean, <clears throat> it's difficult to say what came first you know what I saw first, but I do remember. I have a very very vivid memory of um, loving. Blackadder and finding it very very funny but then the first series I remember you having it on a uh, VHS tape that was kind of like a double uh, backed VHS tape so it was like a huge plastic box mm-hmm. and it you know and it not and it looking very very unfunny <laughs> that's, that's one way to put it mm-hmm. you know it looked at the, the packaging was dark and it was kind of like faded and it just looked like this kind of it didn't look like a comedy show and how a comedy show should be packaged and then we when we finally I, th- I mean I, th- I must have, I think it was I was so young I probably just walked in on small parts of it and I remember sort of gore and violence and 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 you know dark camera work and I just thinking well this is not only not funny but this is terrifying this is this this scared me uh, so that was my experience of the first series but then um, I was also young enough to find the other series really really funny because they were you know just seemed a lot more light hearted and kind of. You know, just 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 made me laugh a lot. And then as we grew up, I uh, 
I absolutely binged on the second, third, and fourth series and didn't really have much interest in the first because I think I was put off early by its kind of dark tone. Yeah, well, I was th- I was thinking about this because because we had so this would be so for context that the entire Blackadder franchise, you know, the sort of classic franchise, uh, started on British television in 1983 and it finished in 1988 with the much acclaimed Blackadder Goes Forth, and that was the year you were born. Um, yeah. So, so I, I, our parents, um, our dad in particular, uh, were, were quite assiduous, uh, ta- you know, tapers of, of shows. You know, they, they they tape things on video all the time, and these were labelled around our house, so we picked these up. So I think in the probably about the start of the nineties, probably when I was about six, something like that, six seven, um, we would have started, you know, picking up some of that stuff. Dad would have been encouraging us to watch it somewhat, you know, um, in terms of the second, third, fourth series of Blackadder, they they would have been taped off off then relatively recent TV, and I suspect they were repeated quite a lot as well. Uh, which the first series wasn't <laughs> so much. I think. <laughs> yeah. I think that's. I think that's probably. It's probably two things. It's probably the fact that the first series wasn't repeated very much. That Dad didn't have it on video. But it's probably the fact that they probably. I'll have to check this with Mum. But it's probably the fact that they didn't own a video when it was on. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, because they wouldn't have had one in the. Well, I don't know. I guess they would have had one just by the mid eighties at the earliest. Probably later. Pro- probably. I, I mean, our dad was enough of a completist that you'd you'd know even if he didn't particularly like the first series, he would have taped it. You know. <laughs> like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. An avid collector. Yeah, yeah. Although I suppose, obviously, with the first series, you wouldn't know whether you were a Blackadder fan yet or not, as it was just on. But, um, but yeah, I don't think the BBC repeated it very much. But so yeah, we, I, I became familiar with the, the second, third, and fourth series, and then that video that you're remembering, the one that was bought from from our local Woolworths, um, that was I, I looked this up, and that became available in 1992. So right. I must have been seven, seven at the earliest. I think I was probably about eight, because I remember pushing for it. It was like you know we've talked before about um, how we you know almost like I had to campaign as, as a lot of kids do to see these movies <laughs> yeah. you know like you know to, to an extent obviously you, you get to see, you get around your parents and you see some stuff at other people's houses you know you sneak some stuff up you know obviously yeah um but um but some stuff you do basically need your parents as get gatekeepers to agree to or rent you or buy, buy you and yeah so you need, you need to keep it up and it's no short there's no uh it's no easy task you have to keep up the uh, can we go to mount splash more can we go to mount splash more you have to keep, <laughs> keep up the the nagging quite a lot it's a, it's quite a fine art really yeah, the Mount Splashmore uh, strategy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, the Splashmore strategy, they will call it that. Yeah, I like that. Um, but yeah, the, it, I mean, Alien was a big one for, for, for both of us. But um, the first series of Blackadder is a bit like that because I, I had to campaign to get mum and dad to buy me that because that, that video you're remembering was a 15 certificate. Ah. Um, and I was, you know, as I say, I was eight. I think so. Yeah. So they would have been well within the rights not to cave in. Uh, I don't know what on earth I traded for that. You know how many times I had to wash the car or whatever. You know, but uh, it was uh, got it in the end. Yeah, well, I was I was fascinated by it because I was. I, I talked about dad being a completist. Obviously, we both inherited some of that, and I I've I was a completist, and I was really interested. And but the other thing about Blackadder is that I was already a big history nerd. You know, like a, like a childhood history nerd because I through things like well, there's things like that, so the horrible history books were coming out in 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 the early 90s i think i'm correct in saying and i was collecting those and i was i was a big nerd about particularly about british monarchial history and that was kind of my in you know i'm i'm not exactly sure where it started that that bit that taken a whole other podcast but like um i I was a big nerd about the royal family history of the the british royal family and that was that that led to a sort of more general interest in history that i've I've kept up a fair bit over over my life um but blackadder um chimed in with that so well that even though it was above my age range um it it, it it just kind of worked you know it, it really just it, it slotted in so nicely and and as you say there's a lot of kind of you know cheeky fairly light-hearted humor in amongst the darkness in in, in especially in those latter series of black and where they've kind of cracked the formula you know um so it just it just worked really well but but i'll get more into this when we're talking specifically about the first series episodes but the um the the, the way in which the first series plays around with some of that monarchical history piqued my interest even then uh, but what yeah but getting hold of that um that vi- that video box set was was a bit like a sort of sitcom video nasty. It really was. Um, <laughs> That's you talk a really about good being... way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it really was because 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 um yeah, we'll talk about the sort of aesthetic qualities of the first series, but um I didn't really know what was going on because because just in terms of style and content, it was sort of weirdly familiar but warped. You know, because if you come to it after the other ones, it's like this bizarre alternate universe where there's a whole bunch of different actors, but even the same actors are playing things differently or are differently cast and styled and. You know, it's all shot on uh, for then expensive BBC film as, as opposed to the sort of studio video that we were used to. I mean, we wouldn't have had these terms, obviously, but, you know, that was... It's, it's very much, I think, that, you know, the, the other one could be described as a sitcom. This is kind of a, a black comedy, isn't it? I mean, it is a sitcom format, but it's it's a <clears throat> very much... Um, it takes elements from the young ones, 
in terms of its darkness and its, you know, kind of like uh, gross out humor, but also it has that historical context and it's filmed very, you know, very well. It, you know, like all the all the costumes are very accurate, you know, like period costumes, and it has that long intro at the beginning, you know, the sort of text scrolling text about the Blackadder. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, now I completely get it, and I really, I, on when I rewatched it, I really, really enjoyed it. But it's in in the same way that. When I first saw American Werewolf in London, I didn't get the comedy because it was there was so much darkness surrounding it. I didn't understand how this could possibly be funny because my expectations of comedy w- w- were completely different. You know, I thought comedy had to be bright and fuzzy. You know, that's and this this can't possibly be funny because it's so dark and terrifying looking. Mm. Uh, but now you understand it as a uh, you know complete black comedy. Yeah, and I think well, you know, and I think it's fair. To, I think we're on relatively the same page with this, but it's fair to say it isn't as funny as well as as the other series. I. I when I was preparing this podcast uh, months ago, I thought it, uh, what I really wanted to do was be really iconoclastic and come come at you with like, oh, it's actually a secret masterpiece and it's actually, you know, it's absolutely brilliant and, and it's actually maybe even better than the other series. And while while I think it is remarkable and like that, I do love it. Uh, to be fair, I do love it. It's a curiosity. <laughs> yeah, it's a curiosity. And, and, and it, it does have moments that are quite funny, I think, I, I, and particularly actors who really shine in this. But, but, but I think there is a certain truth to the sort of... Um, widely peddled truism that it, it's not quite there yet you know like it, it's it's just not it's just not there yet it, whilst it's a fascinated as you say like dark comedy slash drama it's not there yet as a sitcom well for me it's it's the the the, the characterization because you know what what they did was we'll talk about the pilot shortly because that was actually a really interesting turnaround but the, the basic format for the first series is that kind of everyone's an idiot basically that's that's the problem you know everyone there's no character that is kind of superior to another they're all kind of either they're all compromised they're all either like you know egomaniacs you know psychopaths or idiots you know like they're all but in blackadder two three and four blackadder always kind of has the upper hand or always has at least the intellectual upper hand on everyone Mm. and that's where the comedy lies for me this world weary character who kind of understands what's going on Whereas in the first one, Blackadder, the Blackadder doesn't understand what's going on. You know, he's trying to get the upper hand, but he's an idiot as well. And uh, that, so for me, that's not as funny because I think you need that character on screen that is kind of you that you can relate to. Mm. It doesn't have to be the main character, but in the, you know, in the, in the case of uh, Blackadder series two, three, and four, you had that. Yeah, you were, you were Blackadder. You were sort of in this crazy world, and you could kind of navigate it through his eyes. Mm. But in the first series, as I said, everyone's an idiot, so it doesn't really have that same pull. It doesn't pull you in as much, I don't think. Yeah, there's just stuff as well, like, you know, that it's a slightly different cast, and we'll, we'll talk about the cast in a minute, but, you know, the, the, there's also just that thing of, like, you know, a, a bunch of them hadn't really worked together very much yet, and they were, you know, working together on um, location filming largely, you know, um, untried and, you know, like, long hours, and, you, you know, it, they hadn't gelled yet, you know, really, and, you know, either in terms of character or, or the actors, and I think maybe even arguably even more so than for drama this is such a blanket statement but you know you you arguably need in sitcom characters characters and actors who gel and have chemistry don't you i mean that the, the whole thing's kind of carried on that often you know? yeah if it does feel like a launch pad in that way like um initial breaking of the ice where like you said they didn't really know what the characterization was yet you know they weren't really kind of you know they hadn't almost figured it out you know how the how these characters would interact you know it doesn't kind of feel like they've got the chemistry right yet yeah i mean uh, probably the person who's most there in terms of at least gelling with the second series is Percy really isn't it like you know, Tim McInerney even Baldrick to a to an extent you know it's kind of like you know that that's the other thing is where his mind is a kind of almost intellectual su- superiors to him which I, I, I get the you know the, what the joke is there you've got a lord who is like an idiot that's kind of funny but you know it's uh, as I said I just felt that the, the the sort of u-turn they did in series two and made him the, the, you know the the intellectual superior and everyone else and he's just trapped in this world of of sycophants and idiots and you know and and uh, psychopaths that that's funnier mm. to me um as i said and it's kind of it really has f- shaped my sense of humor as much as south park and monty python blackadder is you know just i think where all my sort of you know smart aleck sense of humor comes from is blackadder's retorts to things you know because you, you, you um when you're feeling you you know when you're feeling high and mighty you always kind of like you know feel like you're in that situation where you you know best and everyone else is an idiot you know <laughs> yeah yeah oh well that yeah that's certainly that's, that's one of the things Rowan Atkinson excels at isn't it um as, as the as the sort of franchise goes on um that that reminds me actually we just, so we, we'll talk a little bit about the sort of cast that's specific to season one but um I'll just talk a little bit about Rowan Atkinson first because um you mentioned the young ones before and you know Rowan Atkinson 
uh, was a sort of equally formative part of late seventies eighties comedy in the sense that he'd come out out of Oxford and Oxford reviews and. Um, I, I actually I, I only learned this reading up yesterday. Um, I just assumed Rowan Atkinson did a sort of like, you know arts degree or a language degree yeah. or something something like that. Did you know he, he went to Oxford to become a master's level electrical engineer? What well, that's no, I didn't know that, but I did know he had a very big interest in cars. So maybe that's you know what was the sort of seeds and the roots of that. But uh, but no, that's uh, what, what again. What a U turn! That's incredible. Yeah, well, it was just an. I mean, I know people go to Oxford to study practical things, you know. But, yeah. but it's just it's not the kind of cliche in a way, is it? You know. So I just. But apparently, he was in, he was engaging in sort of doctoral work. But when he when he decided to pack it in and do acting, you know, so he. It's too logical for a comedian somehow, you know, to be you know into interested in something like that. You know, you just uh, you just just wouldn't associate. You know, you think maybe something like history or you know english or you know something like that or of course drama and film but not uh yeah not engineering that's uh that's crazy it's kind of up there with uh, graham chapman being a doctor and stuff like that isn't it you know <laughs> it's, it's, yeah yeah exactly yeah that's uh that's uh the, the <laughs> yeah it just doesn't it doesn't compute somehow does it that kind of like logical brain you know it shouldn't really work like that but uh, yeah it's, it's against the, the the cliche anyway um yeah but yeah I mean, it's during his his work at you know his time at oxford and, and his time in the oxford reviews and, and stuff that he met both not only richard curtis who, who co-wrote the first series with him famously but also howard goodall who uh did the score for blackadder and uh you know composed the blackadder theme and he would then work with i think i think on uh, mr bean subsequently as well you know but but yeah he did that wonderful opening to mr bean you know the latin chorus here is the man who is a bean behold the man who is a bean <laughs> that's great i didn't <laughs> yes i remember uh, that was a real shock to me when i found out that I had a translation you know i was like i had a sort of i just assumed it was a you know a, a, an already existing choir piece i didn't know that it was uh, actually written for it but when you see i, I first found that out because the um you only know, have the subtitles on netflix um because of uh, my son luca we have the subtitles on all the time so we can you know mm-hmm. see what's going on because he's you know obviously screaming and running around a lot of the time so um <laughs> yeah it, it just said <laughs> behold the man who is a bean here is the man who is a bean i was like and i looked it up and that's what the translation is in latin that's fantastic that's so amazing, and that's such great attention to parodic details, wasn't it? And that's what you see with all the Blackadder themes, you know, not just in this first series, but you know, in the, the, the in the both uh, without lyrics and and with lyric stuff that you get in the later series. Uh, you know, they're, they're just such loving homages to at least imagined sort of eras of music, aren't they? I, I, they are, and and both series, I think, if I'm not wrong, uh, all three series, the later series, have two themes, don't they? Because they have the uh, opening theme and the ending theme at the end, so they're kind of yeah. quite different. Um, Maybe the maybe goes forth just has one theme I can't remember but anyway it's uh, it, it's great that there's so much music involved and, uh, and the back at a third outro theme is one of my favourites of all time oh that's amazing yeah with the with the sort of frantic drumming and, and everything yeah yeah, the, the yeah it's guitar. like the sort of period drums but used like really rockingly like it's just brilliant yeah it's superb yeah no I love that one too. Um, so, I mean, Aaron Atkinson was had, had made his name by the time the first series of Blackadder came up with, um, well, a, a bunch of sort of solo radio and TV shows and fringe shows, but also, and, you know, live albums and stuff, some of which we had lying around as kids. But um, he, he was best known, I guess, for Not the Nine O'Clock News, which um, had been on uh, 79 to 82. So this was kind of, but the Blackadder really was his post Not the Nine O'Clock News um, project. And um yeah, we we mentioned actually we said we said we'd get onto this, but like um, in nineteen eighty two, I guess is not the nine o'clock news was 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 airing its final episodes. Um, they did record a pilot for the Blackadder, uh, which never aired. Although um, you can you can get it online, um, and I'll, I'll definitely link to it in the show notes because um, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, yes, this real this really blew my mind. This because uh, I I I think I only found out about this about a year ago. Yeah, well, it was featured. Clips of it were featured in that um, documentary that aired. A, a, couple it was about three four years ago uh, that, that had quite a lot of good material in it i think it was called like the the whole rotten saga or something like that yeah um but but they, they showed a few clips from it in that but it, it then i I'd, I'd heard of it i think but but i i myself had only saw it within the last few years and you can get it in its entirety online so so i've watched the whole thing do you want, do you want to talk a little bit about the pilot yes please yeah because i mean because as someone who thinks that the second third and fourth series are superior this is fascinating because basically they had the formula of the second series uh, in his, in his characterization in this pilot perfectly. He was the smart aleck, the intelligent character, Blackadder and his servants were the idiots. However, the script is pretty much the same than the than the first episode of Blackadder. Is that correct? It, it, it's it's it, it's um, was it a later episode? They rejigged it to become the second episode of, there you of go. the of the Blackadder. But I think this it's a fascinating um, it's a fascinating uh, piece because it shows how much direction 
can change the the the, the tone because it's basically the same script. You know, he's saying the same lines, but he's saying them intelligently instead of you know saying them as an idiot. You know, and it, and it works. It's just basically. So I think a lot of this must come come down to characterization and direction as well as script. You know, and and sort mm. of you know intent because as I said, he's playing it. Uh, you know, he's. he's he's confident he's you know world weary he's been through all this stuff before and it's much much funnier mm. like you know just in this pilot to me and um you know if they if they played the first series like that i think it would have been an even bigger success from the start yeah well it's, it's interesting isn't it because you've, you've got a different slightly different cast in there you've got some of the people who are going to be in the black adder um like elspeth gray and um you know Atkinson himself and tim McInerney. you've got a different baldrick um you've got the king played by john savadin who um I'm not sure if he was then, but he went on to play Fred Elliott in uh, Coronation Street. Oh, no way. Oh, I love him. He, he was in um, Clockwork Orange as well in that amazing scene, you know, with uh, oh, Alex in the Kubrick film, yeah. He's the sort of probation officer guy, isn't he? Uh, he comes I, to visit him at home. I, I don't know what he is. I think he's kind of like, is he a friend of the uh, the writers, isn't he, who ends up kind of basically kidnapping Alex? But in that scene, for people who don't know, you've got Fred Elliott and you've also got the guy who played Darth Vader. <laughs> so it's like just the weirdest round table, as well as... Um, oh, is that... Is that him? Um, oh, right, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of a different scene in Clockwork Orange. I've just realised. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. You know the yeah. bit where, yeah. So in, in that scene where Alex is like being drugged, you know, he's eating the pasta and being drugged. You've got Fred Elliott sitting on one side, then you've got Malcolm McDowell, and then you've got Darth Vader on the other. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, and then Kubrick yeah. was in the room as well. You know, just what a strange round table. Very strange. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating pilot, and, and one of the things about it, I'll get more into this when we talk about the specific episodes, but one of the things is it perhaps more typically it's um, cast sort of vaguely historically, that pilot. Like, it's, it's I think it, they say like 400 years ago, and it's set at a court which has like a fictional king and queen, and the queen looks a little bit like Elizabeth I, but the, the king, you know, the princes are fictional, and, you know, Edmund himself is, doesn't ah, fit anywhere. So it's much less specific. Much less specific, and obviously there are things, obviously there are anachronistic things in Blackadder. There's, I'm not claiming it's like a specifically set historical sitcom in many ways, but it is unusually specifically set, and one of the things I want to, when we talk about the, the, the foretelling, one of the things I want to say is, is how it's almost unnecessarily specific, um, yeah, you know, in, yeah, in ways that yeah. maybe only... You know, only history. I'm not say Ox- Oxbridge history nerds, but only history nerds would really appreciate. You know, it's it's got it's got kind of obviously the alternative comedy of, of the 70s and 80s has this huge shadow of Monty Python over it in a whole bunch of yeah. ways. And one of the things it inherits from Monty Python is this kind of nerdishness for needless. You know, it, it, it t- t- you know in, in terms of like old school comedians would look at it as needless kind of specific. Uh, intellectual references i guess you know like yeah. philosophy references historical references biographical references artistic stuff you know just just stuff stuff that you know it, it doesn't matter if it's for a cheap gag or like a, a big riff or you know an ambitious sketch it, it you'll be very, you'll be more specific than you need to be because it pleases you you know that kind of stuff yeah and it's kind of funny for that as well you know because it's it is so pointlessly uh, specific also i was just thinking like you know perhaps they uh, you know, sold it as that. Perhaps that was like a caveat that they had. They, you know, when they were sending the scripts to the BBC, saying like, "Look, it's a historical drama. Like this is well, not not that they were trying to, you know, that it was a comedy, but you know, not that they were trying to fool them, but just to say, look, this is a really, you know, important stuff here. You know, it is a comedy, but it's like a good way for the kids to absorb it, or you know, something mm. like that. You know, who knows? Like maybe they had to be that specific. Yeah. Well, I, it's funny actually because because there's all sorts of ant- antecedents that you know the black adder could because it seems to come out of somewhere it, it, it's both sort of now this um monolithically famous and influential british sitcom but it's also kind of almost out of nowhere in terms of what it is because i was trying to think of like historical sitcoms you know like where do they actually come from where, where's the sort of legacy there and i'm sure there'll be tons of people you know getting on to me after this episode about with with more obscure examples but the things that were coming to mind were things like the carry-on movies yeah you yeah. know which have that that feature don't they of like um you know characters in different historical eras being played by the same actors you know and, and kind of you know what their traits are even though they may have a different name or they might have, they're living in a different era you kind of know who they are yeah you know so it's kind of uh, arguably the carry movies is only black out of channels more as it goes on actually you know the more that, that they come up with it the, the more they know what they're doing they kind of fall into a sort of carry-on template but i was thinking there's also things like up pompeii you know frankie howard's sitcom where he's playing a roman you know like kind of uh sort of a scheming black adder character in some ways you know with more theatrical elements like talking directly to camera yeah it's that thing of like it, it's 1970s but it's in pompeii it's in rome you know mm-hmm. it's that thing of like sort of transport is like the way you know blazing saddles is 1975 but it's in 1875 you know that kind of thing you know like yeah sort of transposing the sort of the modern attitudes to the older time yeah one thing that i was thinking and this only occurred to me last night when i was re-watching a few of the episodes was um and i had to date check this because i actually had it the wrong way around to start with i was thinking that one thing Blackadder might have influenced in the 80s was Yes Minister 
Um, but actually, Yes Minister started in 1980 and, and, and I think it wrapped up its main series by 84. So, and, and all I mean by that is the fact is in the first series, Edmund is a, a, you know, a minor royal, but he, yeah. he's kind of, you know, from the first episode on, he's given these like tasks to do and he's given these like roles and he's basically given these political tasks where if he messes them up, there'll be consequences. And he's also got these advisors. And so in some ways, it's kind of this um, prototype for a political sitcom you know but but actually yes minister if anything it would have been rowan atkinson and richard curtis watching yes minister and going oh yeah we we can channel some of that you know yeah definitely i mean i mean talk about like a, it's sort of a crux isn't it like you know you've had all these amazing series you know like as you said monty python you had the carry on series that were hugely popular you're gonna make it's kind of like a smart carry on film really isn't it mm. well you're very right to mention the young ones early on as well because the you know the chronology of this is the the first series of the young ones comes out in 82 and the Blackadder comes out. So when they were, you know, writing it and setting it up, and then the uh, first series of Blackadder comes out, and then the second series of the Young One comes out. Wow! Subsequently, and then the second series of Blackadder after some delay. So it's kind of they sort of leapfrog each other, and we'll mention that again when Rick Mail shows up in the uh, last episode of the first yeah. series. <laughs> There's um, a direct link there, but yes, yeah, that that kind of um, the rise of alternative comedy, isn't it? Kind of that thing, you know, mm. that, that strange phrase. You know where where you know everything's quite violent and you know, there's things flying around the set. You know, and uh, I mean the young ones is obviously you know completely responsible for that. But you know, I think there's a little bit of that in this as well. You know, just in terms of the sort of the gross, there's a lot of gross out stuff in it. You know, and just like kind of weird sets and strange objects flying around and stuff. There's a couple of bits in um, one of the episodes. I'll get into this when we talk about the episodes. But one, there's a, one of the episodes I rewatched last night has a couple of moments of people like looking at the camera or sort of um addressing the camera in a way that's very like very notably artificial and sort of breaks the reality of the show that, that felt very very young ones wow yeah that's um yeah i think i barely even noticed them on the rewatch but uh is there sort of like yeah does it does the queen do it a couple of times yeah she 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 does right at the end of, of the episode i'm thinking of it i suppose actually even later in black Eddie, you get a little bit of that I'm, I'm thinking of like um when um lord flash art shows up in series two and the queen looks at the camera and says like i've got such a crush on him you know <laughs> yeah yeah that was the example i was thinking of yeah but uh that's like that feels like a very young ones moment doesn't it so you've got that sort of dna lingering at least into the mid 80s you know and rick mail does it constantly as well i didn't never even thought of that but yeah that is a, a almost like you know this is my format i'm gonna bring it to <laughs> i'm gonna bring it into blackadder yeah oh we could we could i think we've we've talked at length about how, how great that series that the scene in series two uh, when lord flash art shows up is and just how how that almost he just completely hijacks the entire show including its format and filming for five minutes well apparently he was like he quite seriously said like i'll only do this if i get more laughs than rowan you know like you know in the script like you know which is uh, okay you know but uh, i think you are going to get more laughs no matter what <laughs> like, you know, what, what yeah you what a presence rick mail's one of those people who you know he does seem to have had like a, a fair amount of bullshit ego but you kind of you almost can't detach that from his, his like persona is it like you, you almost like you feel like that's almost like just him playing rick mail to an extent well yeah exactly and i had a very quick story uh, a friend of mine i used to work at the cinema with said he um uh, went to a book signing uh, uh, when rick mail released like an autobiography or something and he queued up for hours and hours and hours and he got to the front and uh, he popped his book down in front of rick mail and he said um i just want you to know i just think you're one of the funniest men in the whole world and rick mail said um really well, I think you're a twat. <laughs> Gave him his book back, <laughs> and he was just like so happy with that. He said, like, you know, yeah, Rick yeah. Mail called me a twat. <laughs> like, yes, yeah. you know, I'd walk, I'd walk away happy with that. So yeah. happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, let's talk a little bit about the cast. I just want we talked a little bit about um, some of them before. I just want, before we, I, I want to talk more about the um, the cast that don't crop up in later Blackadder, basically, because I think that's that's interesting to see what the series left behind as well as what it gained. You know, um, uh, but for, I just want to talk a little bit more about Atkinson first um because obviously we talked about how the character is a little bit different in this first series but also the performance is 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 different and i read i read somewhere that rowan atkinson you know they showed up to this like expensive location filming at oldwick castle in northumberland and they were, they were they, it, was, it was snowing you know and he was on a Freezing horse and there were like a horse, yeah other horses standing by and you know the, the whole series cost um i think it's about a million pounds then <laughs> really it was ridiculous ridiculous <laughs> wow. you know like i don't know how they even wangled that in the first place presumably not the nine o'clock news i suppose but um yeah uh, but but Rowan Atkinson apparently you know was preparing for his first scene on the black adder and they, they had his lines and everything and, he, and you know and then he realized that he didn't even know what voice he was going to do he was like <laughs> Oh, what? What does he sound like? You know, and he just hadn't prepared or anything. You know, he's just kind of yeah, freezing to death, like in the winter. Like, I've got to do something. Yeah, maybe that's how we end up with what we got. 
it sounds almost unbelievable that a character, you know, a, a sketch act performer, a storied sketch performer like him could do that, could put, and come to that stage. But it, maybe it just shows how much, how many uh, balls they were juggling at the time, you know. But uh, and uh, how many second thoughts you were having at that, you know, six o'clock in the morning on the back of a horse bit and getting snowed on. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking it, it's worth mentioning because because. So, so like Rowan Atkinson's performance in the in the subsequent Black Adder series is iconic and as you say very charming and roguish and 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 sarcastic and and you know very charismatic and it, it, I think I mentioned this to you before but I, I I once I can't remember one late night googling session I once fell down the, the uh, black hole of Black Adder fan fiction and there's an awful lot out there. this might not surprise you but there's, there's an awful lot out there mostly from a heterosexual um, female perspective but 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 other stuff as well people like Blackadder. Like, people like, like, Blackadder. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, 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 Rowan Atkinson's Blackadder from the, from the second series onwards has something. And, you know, like, you, yeah, I think part of that is the period costume, but also he is a very charismatic, in control presence for a lot of it, you know. And it, yeah, it, I think yeah. personality has a lot to do with it. And, you know, I think he, in the second series especially, he looks a lot buffer because he's got the huge sort of puffed out jacket and the, the frills and the, and does he have like a beard as well, like a goatee or something? He does, yeah. So yeah. he looks great. And, and he doesn't look like Rowan Atkinson's build at all. He looks a lot taller and like bigger. He's, he's, he's quite a transformation, really. The second series. Is, is probably like the most glamorous Rowan Atkinson ever looked as an actor basically isn't it like that's kind of oh definitely and and how oh god I, I hate to ask you this question because I'm scared of the answer how old would he <laughs> have been in the second series oh you know it's terrible I, I, I have to work backwards but um I know that I'm now older than he was when he finished the fourth series oh what no so that's like one of those Beatles breaking up things where you're just like, oh no. Like, Fourth you know, series. Like, I hope there's a second act in British Lives because I, otherwise I'm screwed. But, um, well, Ricky Gervais he, made it big when he was 39, so he's still got a bit of time. I, I might be wrong here, but I think approximately, I think he was probably only about 28 when this, 28, 29 when this first series came out. <laughs> no, 28. No, that's yeah. not cool. No, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, you know, getting on to the later series, wasn't, um, wasn't Stephen Fry only in his like... Uh, late 20s when he played general melchit or something like it, it was it's it's something it's ridiculous honestly like these people coming out and play, playing these like middle-aged figures and, and i was and and still i'm genuinely convinced in when i watched that show that stephen fry is a 65 year old man you know oh yeah 65 year old like um you know general with like a whole like life of debauchery behind him and everything you know it's, yeah it's... i mean what i mean talk about a performance i mean and you know it's just perfect i never questioned that character it was one of those you know when i saw stephen fry after that and i realized oh he's a he's a he's not an old man you know that's crazy you know it was kind of those, it was it was a bit like um with uh peter k you know when i re when i watched um phoenix knights for the first time and then realized that oh peter k isn't an old man in a wheelchair you know that was a uh, that <laughs> quite convincing yeah it's really cute isn't it when you on that documentary about blackadder when you see them rehearsing there's some great rehearsal footage largely from the fourth series where you see them all rehearsing it and stephen fry is just like slightly manically obviously given his given his uh, makeup he's he's like uh sort of giggling just ever everyone else rehearsing he's just loving absolutely loving being in that ensemble you know yeah yeah it's really nice to see so yeah so what i meant to say sorry that was rambling for me uh but uh what i meant to say about rowan atkinson specifically is is the sort of performance he ends up with for for edmund in series one is you know, obviously it's not coloured by any of that stuff to come later you know any of that sort of charisma and um, poise and, and, and style but but it, it's it is a good you know it's it's a hell of a performance in its own right you know it's it, in a completely different direction you know it, it's this kind of drawing much more on his like directly on his kind of physical comedy background isn't it on his sort of like you know because you watch some of those early live shows in the late 70s and stuff and he is you know he's moving like a dancer around the stage isn't he like yeah kind of yeah incredibly agile he's got he's got those long legs yeah and he and you know and, and you know everyone talks about his rubbery face you know and his, his imp- expressions and everything and you know the, the the edmund he's playing in the first series is barely, barely human almost isn't he like without <laughs> without much makeup although obviously the haircut helps um, yeah, he's, he's very repulsive, isn't he? He's not like a, you know, a likable, lovable character or anything. You know, he's he's just constantly scheming, and yeah, he's like a little lizard creature or something. <laughs> he's just horrible. Yeah, and he's got that voice where he can barely even get things out often, and it, it kind of comes out in this sort of yeah, of, there kind you of go, gurgle, yeah, and, you know. Yeah. Especially when he's scared, you know, which he often is because he's portrayed as, you know, like it's not like any Blackadder wins awards for bravery, but you know, he he's more scared than other Blackadders. And the other other Blackadders want to avoid trouble and death, and who wouldn't? Yeah. But he, and certainly not, you know, they don't want to put the life on the line or the neck on the line. But like he, he's actually actively scared, you know, and simpering. He, he's not good at hiding it. Yeah, I think that's the difference, isn't it? Like you know, the other Blackadders can be afraid of, of situations, but they do it in a very, very deadpan kind of way, mm. you know, which is funnier. But yeah, he's that his stuttering, you know, and he's like, um, I, I didn't actually see him. I, um, you know, he's like moving yeah. back against the wall, and those takes are just amazing, man. Like you know, it's it's a great performance, like no doubt. It's just 
not a particularly lovable one. <laughs> yeah, it would have been interesting to see him break character in, in between takes, actually, because obviously Rowan Atkinson is is quite a suave dude in real life. You know, he's closer to that black, to the later Blackadder than, than he is to the first one, and it would have been weird to see him come yeah, out. He's, he's almost like an electrical engineer or something, you know, when he's speaking. <laughs> Funnily enough, <laughs> yeah, he's almost like a qualified electrical engineer. <laughs> yeah, like um, a normal person. That's still blowing my mind. That yeah, um, but uh, but yeah, no, it, it's it's quite a thing, and we'll get more onto that because yeah, we're talking about his um, cowardliness, but obviously he's also kind of the most ambitious as well even even though and this is the, this is the thing don't let me forget this because Blackadder's even for British sitcoms Blackadder is all about class like yeah. much more explicitly than most British sitcoms and it, it allows its historical setting to illuminate that um, and it's weird because he's the most ambitious but he's also the nearest to the top of the tree that Blackadder ever gets yeah that's true yeah he's actually already kind of won in a lot of ways well if he, if he yeah if he was happy with that that's the thing isn't it like you know he could he's one of the richest most powerful people in the kingdom but he just can't settle for that you yeah know? Well, that's that's his downfall isn't it as often rich powerful people can't yeah obviously uh, it's not inaccurate I just wanted to, before we break and talk more specifically about the episodes, I just wanted to, as I say, talk a bit more about the actors who would be left behind by later iterations of Blackadder. So the obvious one to talk about is Brian Blessed as as King Richard IV in this from, from the first episode on. What a powerhouse. Um, it's just <laughs> incredible. Harry, call for silence! Silence! <laughs> This day has been, as twere, a mighty stew in which the beef of victory was mixed with the vile turnip of sweet Richard slain and the grisly dumpling of his killer fled. But we must eat the yellow wobbly parts. <laughs> in life, each man gets what he deserves. Well, come on. Let's go and kill some more prisoners. Ridiculous. And kind of, kind of my, well, no, almost certainly my introduction to um, Brian Blessed, because I, I was a bit older when I saw Flash Gordon, for example. Um, I uh, Confession, I've still never seen Flash Gordon, my bad. <laughs> it is entertaining. Um, I actually, one of, the, one of the links to Flash Gordon, I think, is, um, you know, we talk about where people get their performances from. There's a few different flavors of Brian Blessed in the sort of work he's done over the years because obviously he's done tons of Shakespeare, you know, on, on telly and, and theatrically, and he cropped up with Doctor Who at one point, you know, and he, yeah. he's, he's done a whole bunch of stuff. But one of the things that I know him from now that I didn't at the time I watched Blackhead as a kid, Peppa Pig, is I Claudius. Oh, Peppa Pig, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's in that. <laughs> obviously, his canonical work in Peppa Pig, but uh, yeah, I, so I'm quite a big fan of Peppa Pig. I watch it quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the thing about having a young son, isn't it? You, you, yes. you obviously have a slightly different frame of reference yes. uh, recently. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in, in my in my mid twenties, I got the DVD finally of, of I Claudius oh. and, and watched it and got quite into it um, and read the book at the same time. Um, yeah, so, so so Brian Blessed is one of his big TV roles is, is he plays Augustus in in I Claudius for the sort of first third or so of, of, of the series of I Claudius, and and what I realised rewatching Blackadder earlier this year was what he's kind of doing in that because 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 as augustus he's, he's much subtler you know it's like it's like as subtle as brian blessed ever gets and it is quite a good it's a great performance actually i think you know it's it's much more scheming he's, he's still very um almost literally jovian you know when, when he needs to be jovial and you know kind of he can be the life and soul of the party and he can be the master of ceremonies yeah. but he's also quite um a control freak and he's quite exacting and he's quite um, meticulous and um he can also be quite chilling there's bits where he's like you know he really threatens people and you really feel it you know he knows what he's doing at times yeah yeah um this is this performance of Richard the Fourth is that blended with um, the Hawkman from from uh, Flash Gordon. You know, it's that. So there's no subtlety in it at all, like there would be in I Claudius. It's just dialed up completely. Well, there's a bit. I, I think it's a blend. I think it's like if uh, Augustus got in the telepod with with the Hawkman from Flash Gordon. You know, and it's kind of because it's kind of Augustus's role as like the king. You know, at this court setting and you know, but it's, it, bossing his his family about and stuff like that. But combined with the the the, the amplitude and the kind of vivaciousness and um, you know, stupidity of of, of, of that character you know it's kind of well, I, I remember on the rewatch you know when he's standing on the dining table and kicking off the plates and like making a big speech I was like I really hope no one told him to do that you know I really hope that that's just him 
you know, like in, in on the set on the day, he just thought I'm just going to you know kick the plates off the table and do my speech from here. You know, I just think like, yeah, that, that well, seems like a very blind, prime blessed thing to do. Well, and that that you know, unlike Rowan Atkinson, that does seem like it's nearer his real persona, doesn't it? Because you know, he's one of the few actors. I'm sure there's more to it than this. There's preparation involved and, and everything, but you know, it's it, it's he's one of the actors you can imagine them just saying, just turn up and do Brian Blessed stuff. You know, yeah, just 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 keep do that again. Just whatever you just did, let's just do another take for safety because it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he's great in it, you know. He's, um, you know, in the first episode, he's doing all the sort of cod Shakespearean stuff, and he's getting to act alongside Peter Cook, you know, of, of whom more later. Um, but um, he, yeah, and he's he's being so so rambunctious and, and operatic, you know, and filling filling those spaces, those hallways, you know, those actual castle sort of sets and stuff, you know, well not sets. I think I think most of it's filmed in in castles, you know, um, and really 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 getting that stage and using it you know and, and obviously being tremendously intimidating to Edmund as well so because when you've got Rowan Atkinson going one way in the sort of sniveling creeping direction you know you've got him absolutely pushing him to the walls with with that performance you know yeah yeah it's, it's a it, it's a great um pair pairing actually it does it does work really really well it's definitely one of the series strengths I'm actually quite attached to Robert East as um uh, Prince Harry as well you know he's he's you know no, I don't think many even Blackadder fans would consider him one of the sort of franchise highlights but I, I actually I think he just in a, in a very low-key way he just gets the job done you know well I like the way that him and the mother you know like Edmund's mum are just in a completely different thing you know I love that the way yeah. that, their performances they're just like in a completely different show and I love that and I, I find in the same way as Prince Harry I find the mum absolutely hilarious just the way she delivers her lines really subtly yeah and, uh, and there's all this madness going on and she just responds you know like normally that's just fantastic. yeah she seems she's very good in it. well they're sort of um I suppose like the, the actually Baron Blessed as well but but them as a trio like you know the the dad the mum and the older brother they are they are playing a sort of um sitcom core in a way aren't they love and they're all kind of quite well-meaning and like none of them actively wish Edmund harm you know, like they're they're all kind of like like particularly the dad and Prince Harry just because the power. You know, like they can cause him harm, but they're not really out to get yeah. him or anything. He's if anything, he's out to get them. It's 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 just that it's just they have this power. Well, he makes all of his own trouble, doesn't he? Like as you said, he's in a very comfortable situation, and you know he 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 just. Uh... Yeah, he he digs all of his own graves, doesn't he? And <laughs> it's, it's just like yeah. there's literally no reason for him to be really dissatisfied. Everyone treats him pretty well, <laughs> you know. It's like, yeah, you know, he really is his own th- worst enemy. I think the best showcase of um uh, both Robert East and Elspeth Gray actually is in uh, the Witch Smeller uh, episode where actually actually I don't know what was going on with him, but you know the king is largely absent. Um, I suppose to allow them to shine more, uh, you know, as characters. But th- they're both great in that because you know they both essentially allow and. Uh, aid this witch trial to go ahead but the, the, but they never seem anything less than utterly reasonable you know yeah. like, especially yeah. prince prince harry is just you know he's good at his witch trial and he always seems he's but he's, he's always really interested you know he's always like kind of like uh i suppose he's playing that riff on the royal family isn't he that stephen fry does later when he's um playing a sort of very prince charles-esque um charles the first and things like that you know he always sort of always believes the best of them yeah you know, he's just always kind of listening. He's always got like an actual attentive ear. Like, you know, he's, he's like, he's not, he's not a sort of monster who's made his mind up about these things. Like, yeah, it's just brilliant. And I think that's the one thing that grounds it is those performances in a way, you know, because it's just, you, you can't have too many people acting ridiculous. You need to have those kind of like, you know, pegs in the ground. Yeah. Well, the one thing I like about this first series of, of Black Eyed they're saying, you know, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a monarchy buff, but not a monarchy fan. You know, I'm, I'm not a monarchist. I'm, I'm a Republican. Um, I think the monarchy should not exist. Um, I was actually coloured when I when I watched. Um, I kind of it was it was something I read when I was um, a teenager, I think. Uh, and I read that basically it's some historian. He basically said that it, it helps, particularly when you think about the medieval royal family in, in Britain, but other countries as well. It helps if you just think of them more as mob bosses. Yeah. Like we have, we have afford them all this glory and honour and like validation now because of the heritage. But they were just they're just the sons and daughters of people who took whatever they could because they had more power and yeah. they had people killed and they had people murdered at night and they, they had people threatened and they made people leave the country and you know it, they they took all the money and you know it, it's they're not, they're not they were not nice people and never were you know like that's the, that's the legacy that's the roots of it that's where it like you know ends up you can't trace it back anywhere else yeah no it's nothing and like you know and and this is one thing i like about blackadder because this is this is this is i'll touch on this briefly in in 2014 michael gove when he was education secretary in, in the tail end of the coalition government he was um he, he he wrote a piece about how you know Blackadder had poisoned sort of the, a generation of minds of young people. I'm paraphrasing, you know, but like kind of how the cynicism of Blackadder and the anti-Britishness of Blackadder, um, as he perceived it, 
bizarrely had done things like you know made made people think that the first world war was all our fault and things like yeah, that you know and yeah. kind of uh, you know it had made people too cynical about british history and not understand that it was a just war and it made people think it had been this series of incompetent cock-ups and you know how people should be more proud of their british history and everything and it was like and this is the sort of rubbish you've been hearing from tory politicians increasingly as the decades worn on i think he was a sort of canary down the mine for that yeah um but i don't it, it, you'll, you'll probably agree with me matt but like blackhead is one of the things as a british person i'm i am proud of yeah oh that's 100 percent yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, I never actually read it that way either. You know, I think that, you know, it's funny, isn't it, that how, you know, <laughs> that Michael Gove sees what he wants to see. You know, it's kind of interesting that, you know, that he's almost more vulnerable than we are in terms of, you know, he that's what he sees in that. I, I just saw it yeah. as like individual, you know, um, in, individual weaknesses and like, you know, people being sort of, you know, it was never, it was never a sort of a patriotic thing you know like or an anti-patriotic i don't know yeah it's, it's it's interesting how people read into comedy and drama what they want to you know well it's the twisting of patriotism and pride and self-respect as being about these historical figures who it shouldn't be invested in isn't it like my lack of respect for the royal family and the historical royal family doesn't make me not proud to be british or glad to be british or anything yeah. it, it just makes me correctly identify the lying thieving murderers in our history yeah ex- exactly you know, yeah that's so uh, that we hopefully we learn from that's not what my british my britishness is not about them it's not about worshipping them it's not about revering them you know it's that doesn't make me less british or less patriotic yeah, you're it? allowed to learn from your mistakes as well you know it's like you can't have a perfect history you know it's just uh it's uh yeah it's, it's, it's that's really interesting that it's a bizarre strain of, of um conservatism not just british conservatism but conservatism that demands a respect for the dead you know as if as if they you know that usually the rich dead i should say but like the 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 dead as if they care yeah as if they care now <laughs> yeah they know what they did <laughs> yeah well yeah that too um but yeah no, no, i agree that they're, they're, they're great performances and, and although the series would go on to great and greater strengths and you know as i say develop that ensemble and the, the sort of core uh dynamics um you know it, it does you know it loses something by leaving those actors behind even though it, it more than restocks the cupboard so to speak um i should mention actually that this is the only black adder series of the four without any hugh laurie in it yes um, that's true yeah or, or or stephen fry actually so so this is before i guess i guess they were i'll have to look it up but i think they were still maybe just about to make their name with fry and laurie and stuff you know so although they may have known them they, they, they weren't really tv personalities yet as such although although they're both in the um Oh, actually, in, in the second series of The Young Ones, they're both in the, the University Challenge episode, aren't they, after this? Oh, of course, yeah. I forgot, because that was Stephen Fry was in that. Uh, so how brilliant is that? <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I mean, in terms of episodes of TV, Desert Island Discs, that would definitely be one of mine. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely a Young Ones podcast coming down the line on this on this show yeah. at some point. I'll take that one um, and the Dictionary episode of Blackadder, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good, strong choices. Thank you. <laughs> um Okay, so we'll just we'll just take a break because we've touched on quite a lot about Blackadder in general there, and you know about the, the first series. Um, uh, you know, in what ways it differs from from the other series. But um, we'll just take a little break now, um, and um, then we'll come back and talk more about the first series specifically. And I, I kind of have quite a bit I want to say about it, the structure of it and and how that goes. So um, yeah, see you guys in a sec. Awesome. Well, well let's take hell. Um, you know, hell isn't as bad as it's cracked up to be. What? No, 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 no. No, you see, the thing about heaven is that heaven is for people who like the sort of things that go on in heaven. Like, uh, well, singing, talking to God, watering pot plants. Whereas hell, on the other hand, is, is for people who like the other sorts of things. Adultery, pillage torture those areas really mm. leave your lands to the crown and once you're dead you will have the time of your life adultery pillage through all eternity yep <laughs> your blood sticks against your tender portions oh. Oh. well bravery more decision very well i leave my lands to the crown and my soul in the hands of the Lord. May he treat me like the piece of refuse that I am and send me to hell. Amen. Amen. You're a very lucky man. I wish I could be coming with you, but, you know, being Archbishop. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Welcome back. Um, so me and Matt are just going to talk now a little bit more about the specifics of that first series of The Black Adder and talk a little bit about the episodes in it and, and the kind of series structure of it and why it's different from the other series. Um, I, I found it a fascinating experience rewatching these this year because I think 
um, it's always interesting to rewatch really stuff that you feel passionate about and that you saw when you were younger. Um, but it, I think on this viewing, I put in place, at least for my own satisfaction, some of the reasons why I think the first series is so memorable and so strange and kind of so unsuccessful, but such a fascinating jumbled up thing, basically. So, so see what you think of this, Matt, because because I the six episodes as is typical for British series, um, but I think what they are basically is they are this like atypical but basically standard sitcom in the middle so like the, the four episodes in the middle are a sitcom yeah and then they are bordered by this extraordinary first episode which functions more like a dramatic pilot um than a sitcom pilot or first episode yeah and and then at the end um the final episode the black seal is like a dramatic finale or a even a spin-off movie in some ways i was thinking watching it last night um sort of bookended bookended it's bookended by these two things that don't really work in sitcoms or that sitcoms don't normally use yeah and that's one of the things that makes it really bizarre and um and they try and sort of make the show have an arc as well in the way that the other ones don't and i think that we'll talk about the first the first episode in a sec i think the first episode is really memorable and odd but not really influential on what the rest of black adder becomes because they never really do that again but i think the second the, the, the finale actually has quite a lot of influence on the rest of black adder and what they would do in later series yeah. so that's my that's my thesis in in, in short that, that's pretty accurate and i think that's why uh, also why it doesn't grab people as much because you know you again you, you you've not setting out your mission statement from the beginning you're not starting as you mean to go on which is kind of strange you know so like i think it would be better if people started with episode two maybe with like a brief summary at the beginning i'm not you know i'm not saying people should do that i just mean like you know it would have been better a production if they'd done that maybe well as indeed they they sort of did, did. and initially you, you talk before about things they they kind of got spot on with the pilot and and then then they refigured the pilot to be episode two yeah yeah they could have done the whole first episode as kind of maybe just like a you know a funny pre-ramble like you know to the thing like even the de- 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 decapitation of, uh, of of the king you know all that kind of stuff you know just put that as like a footnote at the beginning that's what happened i know i know it kind of needs to be seen but you know to get that stuff over with kind of and then get into the funnies you know yeah you could easily imagine it coming up in dialogue you know this is just some venal thing he's done or, or been witness to in the past you know um yeah that'd be quite funny actually if they brought up as a flash you know like you know do you remember when you cut kill, cut the king's head off it's like shut up Percy. you know that kind of thing you know it'd be kind of funny you know i don't know but, uh... Well, I want to get into I want to get into this because because the, 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 let's get straight into it actually because because the first episode, the foretelling, is one of my most memorable pieces of TV ever. I think uh, that, that I've seen, and it's partly the age I saw it at. But you were talking before about how we got hold of the video. Yeah. So I stuck this video on, having campaigned for months to get it, and I was essentially treated to this bizarre kind of, as you say, like darkly comic mini horror movie mm. in, in a way. Yeah. And and it, but but also one that was completely tied into my interest because, as I say, I was a you know monarchy history nerd uh, you know from from the age of like five ish onwards i think you know but like uh i'd, I'd already so, so i was saying i probably saw this when i was about eight i'd already learned quite a bit about the, the history of the, the plantagenets and the war of the roses and you know the, the the transition into the tudor era and and, and i'd even there was a teacher at my school who's what they call a ricardian i believe which is, is people who believe that richard the third was essentially hard done by you know the historical richard the third was hard done by and the version in shakespeare and stuff while dramatically brilliant is not fair to him as a king and all that kind of stuff. So I already knew a little bit about the background of that. And then I'm confronted with this bizarre... You know, I was talking to you before about how some of this comedy is, is way more specific than it needs to be. This kind of bizarrely specific counterfactual history, you know, because all this gets set up in the first episode where you've got this eve of the Battle of Bosworth Field, you know, the actual Battle of Bosworth Field in, in, in uh, 1485. Um, but then by the end of the episode, you've got this... You, you're in this parallel universe, or, or at least, a, you know, a, a hidden history is yeah. the implication by the end of this history, you know, that history didn't go that way for like a whole few decades of the series. It went differently and you had a different royal family. So you as a schoolboy come in with your history and you think, you know where you are, you, you you know the setting. Is this fair to say the first alternate history you would have ever witnessed as well? That's really interesting, you know. I mean, because I, I, was, I was already a childhood Star Trek fan, so there's kind of the idea of parallel universes mm. and things were, were, were creeping in, I suppose, with things like Mirror Mirror and, you know, there's probably some equivalent TNG episodes like Yesterday's Enterprise and stuff. But um, I, I've been seeing them about the same time as well, though. I don't think I'd seen much TNG at this stage of any. Um, so it was one of yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe, yeah. No, it's, it, it, it probably is. A bit, I mean, it's sort of couched in in, in the Blackadder. It's sort of couched as like um, 
as I say, more of a hidden history, more like, you know, this isn't a parallel universe, this is just what happened and the truth has been hidden for you. Like, the, the prologue actually starts, you know, you have that great narrator, I forget the name of him, but he's, he's the guy who goes on to play uh, Philip of Burgundy. Um, Patrick Allen. Patrick Allen yeah. is the narrator who starts with it. Is it, history has known many great liars. Yeah. That's, the, that's the start <laughs> that's of the it. That's a great opening line, isn't it? I love that. That whole intro is amazing, you know, and obviously introduces Peter Cook as well, who's playing... Um, sort of reenacting the killing of the princes in the tower, but with a fake dagger and being this really avuncular kind of uh, lovely figure. They're really putting their stars up front as well, saying, look, we've got Peter Cook, this is legit. <laughs> yeah, we've got Peter Cook, we've got Brian Blessed, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about, we um, know what we're doing. Talk about, like, the legacy of alternative comedy, you know, Peter Cook being to these, you know, talk about Monty Python's being over these guys. Like, if, if you see Monty Python's the father of alternative comedy, uh, Peter Cook's arguably the grandfather, you know, he's kind of... You, you're really getting some legacy stuff in here as well as so dramatic actors and silly actors as well like brian blessed you are you are getting peter cook who's who's just such a pedigree at this stage yeah you know? really passing the torch um, yeah he I, I mean i should say peter cook probably also my introduction to peter cook this and he absolutely terrified me in this particularly after, you know when he returns as the ghost um yeah but he's also got that he's got that mean edge to him peter cook hasn't he i know he's i know he's sort of at least theoretically playing the nice richard the third in this but he's actually not that nice um <laughs> yeah. and he's just got that he's just got that mean air to him hasn't he peter cook he, 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 he probably accurately he could tear you apart over a conversation you know like uh, yeah he's got the voice but also you know he's just such a good actor you believe him you just believe everything he says you know he's all these purposes that he doesn't look like he's acting you know mm. <laughs> I, mean, I know that's it's such a, i know that's such a kind of a a, a, a sort of you know a, an obvious thing to say about a good performance is that they don't look like they're acting but you know what i mean like that it just it looks like it comes so naturally to them you know but they yeah. but they're completely convincing you know well and he's really riffing on the shakespearean stuff isn't he because like th- particularly in this first series of black out a bit throughout the series as well you know you kind of get these shakespearean riffs and nods and semi quotes and kind of boulderizations but he's really even in his performance he's sort of channeling a sort of Laurence olivier classical shakespearean performance isn't he particularly when he does um bits of you know like mangled bits of the uh, St. Crispin's Day speech and stuff when they're preparing for the battle you know um, that's that's really kind of uh, uh, that's an interesting joke isn't it you know like sort of putting you know using these lines from sort of you know fictional Shakespeare play but then putting them into you know that that's what he actually said and all this kind of stuff yeah. that's really clever stuff you know and uh, really uh, intellectual sort of um, Oxbridge humor right there well that whole bit that that does play like a comedy a comedy sketch inserted in in a way but like the uh, that bit where you get um, Richard the third doing the uh, you know, mangled Shakespeare, but then you get Prime Blessed just just telling people to slit their gizzards open and stuff like that. You know, you, you get you get the sort of truth of war there, but then you get the um, Prince Harry doing the kind of like very twentieth century kind of. Now I'm afraid there's going to be an awful lot of violence, yeah. <laughs> but we know it's all in a good cause. Like he's doing a sort of charity run almost. You know, like kind of... he's doing sort of uh, you know uh, Margaret Thatcher's Conservative Party kind of like rhetoric sort of thing right there mm, so that, is. I, that's quite uh, current in the same way that the young ones have a lot of that but um also it yeah. kind of reminded me of you know mr nice from um from uh, life of brian you know crucifixion good you know, yeah yeah it's, it's a, very that you know, just a middle class guy who's like he doesn't really yeah. want to be there you know he's kind of like it's the similar kind of vibe it's that same spin isn't it? that sort of contemporary the, the voice of contemporary faux caring bureaucracy on the old like the barbarism of the past kind of thing exactly that, that, that that's a great scene that it's funny you mentioned margaret thatcher especially when we talk about warfare but this this actually this series aired about a year after the Falklands War and uh, just uh, I think about a week after uh, in June July 1983 just after the 83 election so Margaret Thatcher just um, she was already in power but she won a massive majority you know this is sort of the foundation of her power for the rest of the 80s um, you know that that had just happened when this series was on um, wow and we think we live in end times can you imagine that that, that environment yeah <laughs> yeah it wouldn't, wouldn't have been a good feeling um, yeah. and I think some, you know you, you might even say some of the bellicosity of, of this you know battle scene is, is, is echoing you know some of the, the horror that um, a lot of the writers would have felt about the Falklands um, I don't know that's just me speculating let's just hope we're cresting another wave right now yeah no, don't say another wave oh no <laughs> no not the wave yeah. um, I think it's fascinating you know so, so I was I was into the Battle of Bosworth Field in, in a sort of nerdy way I, I thought it was really interesting and and I actually love one thing I, I was going to mention the music in a minute but one thing I love about the uh, the setup of Edmund um, riding late to the battle I was I was genuine. I know it's a, it's a budget limitation. It's like it's like um, the same way Game of Thrones in its early going had to avoid direct huge battle scenes because they didn't have the budget for it. Obviously, this is that and more. But I love and genuinely not even from a comedic perspective, from a dramatic perspective. I love just the, the feeling of Edmund approaching the battlefield and all you see is those like halberds and uh, staffs and and bats and you know just you just see the top bit of a battlefield and, and caressing and then all you see of it is Blackadder and Baldrick's reaction to it. They're just looking at it and wincing and kind of like. 
you know uh, oh yeah and then making the sort of funny comments about what you know guys over there doing this and that and yeah yeah the the, um that yeah it's it's uh it's strangely effective isn't it like in a weird way even though it's it's obviously played for laughs that's the whole point and for budget because they couldn't film it but um yeah it really really works in in a way it kind of reminded me of spielberg's war of the worlds (laughs) you know in that way that they they always they don't show and that's not budgetary obviously they just don't show any of the battles and it's um that whole horror thing of what you don't see is way more effective you know yeah no I know, I know exactly one of the bits you're referring to the bit where um it, it, his son is running away from tom cruise and he's he's, he's going to join the battle but you, don't, you all you see from the battle is like distant explosions and you hear yells from afar and, and you see the sort of the humvees like rolling back down the hill on fire and stuff yeah. it I, I really love that film but anyway that's that's a different podcast well it's this thing as well where like you know you, you you're setting up edmund as this um unrelatable cowardly sniveling character but he's but you're also kind of uh, from the very start making him relatable aren't you it's like you know you wouldn't want to join that battle like you know yeah <laughs> like he's 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 meant to is because of his class and you know he's kind of well not you know obviously there's a lot of um, poor people in the battle as well you know but the, the, he's meant to turn up and be brave and stuff and you'd, you but you'd look at that battle take one look and go fuck that yeah there's the, these i think how many royals and or you know people but you know royals would have like just sat out the battles and you know, sat in a shed slit their arm up and gone back to the castle like oh hey, what a great battle was that look at my arm you know it's uh you know mm. there must have been a lot of that going on because you know you're not going to be able to trace anyone in like battles like that you know it's uh it's uh yeah so it, it is very relatable and like why would i join this battle if i don't have to <laughs> it's interesting medieval warfare because you know the battle of bosworth field in british history is 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 often taken to be the end of the middle ages you know and and that's definitely for a different podcast because there's so many definitions you can put on that but as a kid i would think of that as uh, with a very anglo-centric view of history i would think of that as the end of the middle ages um and you know you associate the middle ages with things like horse ho- you know horseback warfare knights you know um pitched battles in fields like that you know um and, and you know, there's all sorts of things you think of, you know, as, as, as the Middle Ages being phased out over the Tudor era, you know, uh, all sorts of economic and, and so, sort of social things, religious things, etc. Um, but Richard III is actually the last English king to die in battle. Oh, really? Um, that's that's another notable thing, you know. So, so like, I'm not I'm not for any minute saying that the the royal family, you know, in history was pulling its weight, its equal weight. Of course they weren't, but they did ride into battle. You know, they did they did they rode into battle usually in a very protected shielded way you know but they didn't always and, and obviously battle techniques were designed to capture them and, and in this case kill them so what, what um, happened to him exactly in real life he was he was just killed by by a soldier or by a specific soldier or uh i mean again slightly too large a topic for this podcast really i, I mean i mean and, and the, the thing with all of this is it's couched through shakespeare you know because like um we have histories obviously but but culturally the shakespeare enactment is is so massively pervasive you know and, and obviously um Peter Cook riffs on that as well, doesn't he? Like when he when he's walking away from the battle afterwards, and he he, he does the "My Kingdom for a Horse" bit, but, yeah, yeah, which you know in most Shakespeare is portrayed desperately, you know, and, and like yelling at the sky and running away breathlessly and stuff. And here it's just like "My Horse, My Kingdom a horse. For a Horse," yeah, <laughs> yeah it's been really <laughs> cheerful. Um, but yeah, he was he was surrounded by Henry Tudor's soldiers and and killed. Probably not by Henry Tudor himself, but but was he the body that was found in the car park recently, or was that someone else? That's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I, about about. Eight years ago now, they're in in Leicester, um, and they could see all the chips of his bones, couldn't they? Where they'd stabbed him. Oh, it's pretty grim that. Yeah, well, I'm, well, I mean, the actual, you know, the actual body of Richard III was almost certainly badly mutilated, and you know, paraded through the streets of nearby towns before being given the burial that he got. Um, you know, which was Rob Stark style. Yeah, I mean, really. Yeah, I mean, if you want to get into Game of Thrones, yeah, I mean, like you know, this draws a lot from this stuff. You know, from 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 this these dynastic wars in particular. Um, so. You, you have the Battle of Bosworth Field take place, and then you know you have this chaotic aftermath in which um, Edmund accidentally uh, kills his um, great uncle. I guess is, is he? Uh, yeah. And so he kill, he kills the king of their own side essentially, and then spends the rest of the episode in a very sitcommy way trying to cover that fact up. In fact, in fact, there's certain echoes of things like the Kipper and the Corpse in Faulty Towers, which is one of the only... yeah, that's true actually. Yeah, that's very very true. Yeah, I love Baldrick's line as well. The um... Oh no, Richard the <laughs> Third! That delivery, <laughs> yeah, no, that's amazing. Yeah, I was, I was going to highlight that line. That's that, that's an early shining moment for Tony Robinson. Brilliant. It's just like 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 this is kind of routine, you know. Like this is like the bad weather today, you know. But... Yeah, it's just like oh god. But that that's kind of almost how Blackadder would react in a following season. That's what I love about it. Is that you know, mm. it, I, well, that's not why that's not why I love about it. That's my criticism of it. Really, is that you know mm. that would have been much funnier if it was delivered by Blackadder. But anyway, it's it's a great first it's a great first episode in that respect and th- th- those scenes are fantastic yeah it 
it, it, we talked before about being a bit traumatized about the the bit when um, not so much the bit where he actually cuts his head off, but the bit where he picks his uh, head up and opens the visor, and you just see Peter Cook's like bloodied face. Um, That's the like, bit. With that pallor. How I would react to horror films and stuff as a little kid was I'd get images stuck in my head, and they would stay with me. Uh, American Werewolf and stuff like that would haunt me for months. That was one of them. That's one of yeah, the main reasons why I was put off it at a young age, because I think I wanted to watch it with you, but I could feel that mum was kind of unsure, you know, that she thought mm. it would be too much for me. Then I walked in on that scene, and that, yeah. that image of his blood face was much more, you know, and when I rewatched it, like, recently, I thought, oh, it's not even that bad, you know, obviously, but, you know, as a kid, that was really disturbing to me, and it stuck with me for a long time. No, me too. I genuinely had nightmares, and, and there's, there's bits later on in the episode when basically every bit where the ghost appears, um, you know, it, and it's 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 not just the way I think he doesn't he do the horror movie cliche of appearing in the mirror behind him. Yeah, yeah, when he's looking in the wardrobe, like in, or in medium shot. Yeah, yeah, it, it's kind of stuff like that. You know, I, I was going to mention the music because um, in the Bosworth scene, it's amazing, and in the build up to it and everything, it, I don't know if it's all Howard Good or like I guess so, but it, it's that um, we've commented before about how like the, the music in this is one of the things that makes it feel weird and kind of a bit disturbing because it's all really amped up cod medieval kind of you know there's a lot of like harpsichords and kind of loops and stuff like that you know but and like huge this is primarily organ stuff. isn't it yeah 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 and it's really it, it really it's very atmospheric i think successfully atmospheric but the, the sort of more horrific bits you know you've got those stabs of um is, is it like organ stabs yeah it's like, dun, 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 kind of and those bits, sort of you know? like rising you know from the bass like the like oh, that's right that one, yeah. that's all done on the organ so i think it is primarily organ yeah really works yeah yeah it's fantastic uh, and that's that's something that makes it feel a bit like a sort of my first horror movie as well um that and the just the level of violence in general um i could I honestly spend ages on saying talk about the foretelling I'd, um just a couple more things i want to mention that you know you've got henry tudor in there as a character who he has to hide in his or they decide to hide in his bed and then he ends up escaping which is is a kind of weird thing because you're almost being reminded about the real history of our world and about the fact that in not killing him or stopping him escaping the future that we know is going to come round again yeah you're kind of like you're reminded that you know that it's like not only is black had a changed history but he's also he's also kind of set it back on course through his incompetence you know like he's kind of done both <laughs> yeah um, yeah exactly which is interesting but um i i was i was thinking about this episode one of the one of the things about this is you know i was talking about it as being more like a dramatic pilot than a sitcom pilot yeah it's because you start with a character and it, it, some sitcoms have done this but you start with this character in one situation and by the end of the episode he's in a completely different situation or at least he's in a yeah no he's in a pretty different situation he actually he talks about you know he gets a new costume he gets a new name he talks about being a prince of the realm now you know being a, a potential heir you know he he's committed accidental murder or well, deliberate murder on, on on someone that he, he didn't want to kill yeah um but it's it, it actually i was thinking and this sounds ridiculous but i was actually thinking more of something like the pilot of breaking bad uh, yeah yeah it's, it's not dissimilar <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, in the sense that you've got someone who, for their time and class and everything, is very mild mannered and simpering and weak, and partly accidentally gets into this murky waters where he his whole life is put on a different track. You know, that's that's not really how many sitcoms work. Is it? Some sitcoms have basic setup. You know, like something like Spaced. You know, Tim and Daisy decide to share a flat. You know, for example. But but this is this is as I say involving killing and the cover up of that killing and stuff like that. You know, it's not. Well, it's also there's that not... sort of transformation superhero scene where he picks his boots and you know all that stuff. And it's it's really like we are establishing this character. This is going to be something that's going to be for, here for a long time. I don't know if that was directly spoofing something like Superman or you know superhero movies that have gone before. But you know, it's kind mm. of it's very interesting the way he, they have that scene and he picks the exact costume that he's going to be wearing. And all that stuff, like that real yeah. setup scene, you know, it's crazy. It's fascinating, yeah. And you've got that sort of, um, is it like an origin story? You're right, and you've got the, um, uh, you know, you're riffing on Shakespeare again with the witches at the end, you know, who, who kind of set up the premise of the show more is that he thinks he should become king. Although they wonderfully undercut that in the uh, post credit sequence, where the, 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 actually they meant to give that prophecy to Henry Tudor <laughs> and they just got the wrong guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the problem with that witches scene is the whole time I just want to be watching the wise woman scene. <laughs> From the, yeah, because <laughs> that exchange between Black uh, Ron Atkinson and the young crone outside uh, the wise woman's, you know, hut in the second series is probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Mm. <laughs> Just to uh, sorry to take it to the other series, but oh no, it's amazing! It, it is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is this Putney? Yeah, because I think one of the witch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't have to put on that voice to me. I'm not a tourist. Uh, <laughs> the um, the <laughs> oh man, I want to watch Black. I don't know. <laughs> The, no, it's tremendous. I think one of the the witches is the wise woman. By the way, that's the connection. You know, the actress who plays yeah. the wise woman. 
<laughs> What's interesting with that witch's scene, you know, I know it's a throwaway joke, but the fact that they've given the wrong guy the prophecy means that you've got this, like, protagonist now laboring under the wrong assumption of prophecy for the entire series, and you, the audience, know that. Yeah. So, like, the fact that he eventually fails to become king should not surprise anyone, you know? Yeah, they're not leaving anything to the... Like, there's no, no tension here. We know it's going to go badly. Like, but, I mean, you know, but that's the comedy part of it, isn't it? Like, you know, you know, is it, you know comedy is usually about colossal failure <laughs> so yeah what's really inter- i'll move on because because we haven't got that much time but I'll, I'll i'll move on um and we can treat the sort of um middle four episodes in a sense as, as, a, as a group but we'll, we'll talk a bit about the specifics but um one thing that i thought was really weird because i was so obsessed with this episode as a kid is the, the whole king's death the, the king's ghost appears not just to him but also that court scene and no one else can hear it you know which is is, is it's a pretty funny scene it, it but also grimly spooky um but then you you have that you know the king's visiting him and he's kind of like richard's ghost is visiting him and kind of he's when when edmund's riding after henry tudor you, you have that wonderful overlay where peter cook snaps his fingers and makes the moors go misty yeah and it's kind of like he's not finished with him you know he's kind of um he helps henry tudor get away you know and you've got this kind of thing throughout the rest of the series where you know if it was a dramatic series you'd have the threat of the revelation that he killed king richard over the entire series wouldn't you and there's there's bits in the late the late series where edmund is put in a position of danger or confession or extreme stress where i think there's little hints where he is going to reveal that you know when he's he's tied to the pyre when he's involved with the archbishop stuff you know um there's this you know even in the last episode there's there's things like there's a bit in the archbishop episode where the guy's doing his deathbed confession and and he's like you know i killed my own father and edmund's like i know how you feel and yeah. like i think in the moment he's meant to be talking about uh, brian blessed's character but i as a nerdy kid i was like oh is he about to tell someone you know i was like but but I don't think you really I don't think they joined the dots up enough you know you're not meant to really think about that you know it's just set up I mean it would have been great if he'd returned actually like you know later on in the series in a way just to show that you know every bad every bit of bad fortune he's had has kind of been up due to him that would be kind of great mm-hmm. but um, maybe they only had him for one episode who knows well this is this is the other anti sitcom thing about the Black Adder because because it, we'll get onto this when we talk about the Black Seal but it's it's like a series that has no intention of having a second series even though Black Adder famously went on to have a second third fourth series you know it's it's the anti yeah, even though you've got this huge setup, like I was talking about with the costume and like developing the character, like you, the, 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 he's dead at the end. Like that's it, we're done. Yeah, yeah. and so is everyone. Yeah, so we'll get onto that. Um, so moving on to the, 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 I mean, the second episode. But as I say, we can sort of take two, um, two, three, four, and five sort of as a unit. Although there's notable things about them. Um, you've got this more sitcomish setting, haven't you? Because you've set up this setting now, which I think actually, as well as sitcom, owes quite a bit to I Claudius. You know, because you've got this. Um, I Claudius is largely about a um, weak, uh, although intelligent in his case, you know, kind of, but, but you know, much preyed upon kind of character who's basically trying to keep his head down and survive a dangerous court setting. And that's essentially the premise for the middle part of the Black Adder, isn't it? You know, that he's surrounded by lunatics and he, he himself has his ambitions, but they, they're usually quite, they're quite backburnery most of the time. The second episode is actually kind of an... Uh, um, an exception to that isn't it because the second episode outside the finale is the only one where he actually makes an active attempt to become king yeah 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 that's the only real push for it yeah which is a bizarre thing to have in the second episode isn't it this is again stuff about the um the black adder in some ways feels like a very very condensed like you know like let's say it had gone for four series or something like 24 episodes this feels almost like a condensed version doesn't it it almost feels like a greatest hit which is a weird thing to say about something that's so flawed and patchy you know yeah. but just because so much happens in a way you know like what you'd do if you were pacing all that stuff out is you'd you'd have the whole first series until he even attempts to try and become king and that would fail you know um, it's like the, yeah the, like you said they had so many ideas early on and they just had one crack at the whip so like let's just get it all condensed in which is not the best way to you know obviously approach a sitcom i don't think you know yeah i suppose you should mm-hmm. always approach a series that you know it, assuming you have at least four more <laughs> like you know or it depends what you what your intent is really but you know it, i think sometimes when ideas and comedy are crammed in too tightly you, you kind of get you lose it a little bit you know because there's just so much going on and that's how i felt about oh, like the witch finder episode in particular i was just like i've kind of lost the plot here i don't really know what's going on like how did he get into this situation again you know it's kind of like it's very uh yeah it's very fast paced there is quite a lot going on and there's a lot of like notable guest actors as well you know we talked about the sort of series regulars you know as they are in this first series but there's um there's people i can't remember the uh the name of the guy who plays uh dougal mccangus in the uh in the second episode is pretty good yeah um he, you know, he's he's great. The, Frank Finley, uh, who plays the Witchfinder in in episode five. I was like, is that Tom Herrera from Slayer? Like for a minute when I was watching, I was like, I'm sure that's the lead singer of Slayer, but like, yeah, I looked it up. You never it know. Not. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, you, you get people cropping up who obviously go on to not only storied careers but also further Black Adder um, appearances, like Miriam Margulies and um, Jim Broadbent. 
yeah um in in the in the otherwise fairly disappointing um fourth episode um the queen of spain's beard because uh, you know they they both they both end up in the show later don't they um she uh, she's um she's his aunt in the second series isn't she um oh that's amazing i love that that that's a great uh with the turnip yeah the yeah phallic turnip yeah yeah that's <laughs> lady white adder yeah <laughs> that's a great episode and then they show up together in uh in uh black and christmas carol of course don't they oh of course there's victoria and albert yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's a great return um <laughs> yeah no amazing i like that i like that one but i mean these these are kind of these are kind of like sitcom uh tropes aren't they i mean you know obviously most sitcoms are stuffed with these kind of things but you know this this one is where you know he has a rival at work essentially you know th- th- that's the sort of premise and then uh you know the archbishop of canterbury episode is where he becomes archbishop of canterbury briefly is basically um you know he gets a new job and like number four is like he's he's got a arranged marriage and he needs to get out of it you know and, and number five is he, he gets in kind of legal trouble and has to get out of it you know and it's a, they're all kind of si- they're, these are si- these are sitcoms you know they're historical sitcoms kind of atypical but they they're basically sitcom tropes so you, here you see like the more sustainable show in a way like the kind of the show that could have run potentially for series and series like it might not have been great but you know it's formulaic and it, it kind of yeah you can see that as you said the typical the comfortable situation comedy the, the things that make it less extraordinary mm. although you've always got like a quite a lot of um stuff wo- woven into it haven't you like you have got stuff about you know the separation of church and state in the archbishop episode you've got um them riffing on the sort of um the death of thomas a beckett you know with it with the uh, brian blessed riffing on the um uh, who will rid me of this turbulent priest stuff yeah. and uh, you know it's particularly the Witchfinder um episode you've really got um I don't know if the name of the rose was 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 um the book at least was was out when this when this came out I think it was about then but um you've got um you know that that I mean that that works quite well as a sort of um demolition of of witch trials doesn't it you know like in miniature um and it's also the sort of the first of Blackadder's um court scenes you know because you'll go on to have uh, uh court you know I think is it most notably in the fourth series where you have that amazing episode uh, corporal punishment about Blackadder's court martial yeah <laughs> it's like the early workings of uh, of that of that kind of dynamic in there and uh, just done so- it's the same kind of joke isn't it because it's basically the uh, massively rigged against you court trial you know yeah like you said you can you can see all the the seeds for these you know ideas and episodes all in the first series really there's a lot of stuff in there that comes to that sort of just just gets perfected and and just is just done so much better later on yeah and you've actually got you know uh, actors like tim McInerney, you know being in in both uh, scenes uh, you know many years later being in black Atticus fourth as, as darling and um he in this first series in, in the Witch Smell of Persuaven, he sort of plays the uh, the role that Hugh Laurie will play in that later episode, where he's the kind of hapless defence counsel who almost ends up getting implicated himself just by even being there. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, you, you've definitely got a lot of sort of comic archetypes that they're discovering, but also that they're going to find more finely hone. Uh, yeah, they sort of cast them better and just you know just realise what they've got. Really, I think you know, there's a lot of stuff in the the first series that, as you said, it's just not cast quite properly. It's just not quite yeah home down but uh you know it, it, like you said it, it's such a an anomaly just such a strange like curiosity this series isn't it well there's uh, there's um yeah i mean it, it, actually the witch smell of persuaven has a, another moment of extreme violence where where, uh, where the witch smeller ends up burning to death um where, where I, I was just again as a kid i just didn't know what to make of it you know i was, I was sort of mildly traumatized by him because it's not it's not really funny you know when it's happening it's it's just horrible yeah well that that's the confusion isn't it like as you said your expectations of a sitcom is for it to be hilarious and it's and it's it's not you know like for most i mean some some it has some funny jokes in it and some moments that make me laugh but you know overall it's more kind of a a strangely bleak historical drama in a lot of ways you know like you know it's it's that's what's so why would anyone set out to make that you know it's just really strange Mm. I think in the uh, in the documentary that they did, the, the the a lot of the cast and writers highlight that in that uh, Archbishop episode, in the third episode, they they kind of hit on that. They highlight that scene, don't they, where the uh, Blackadder, um, Baldrick, and Percy are talking about uh, the religious relics, you know, the, the f- fake religious relics, and they kind of they play a clip of that and they kind of show you how that that, in their opinion, that's kind of the template for how Blackadder would later work. Yeah, um, the three of them in a room to, in a studio set room together talking about something ridiculous and kind of like you know the, the, the specific character dynamics are a bit different but that you can definitely see how that scene would easily fit in the second series for example yeah i think i think things in studio settings are just usually much more funny than the bits that are set on fi- that, that are filmed really you know the film uh, the, the, there's a lot there's a lot of unnecessary filming i think <laughs> you know so to speak i think a lot i think it could have been served a lot better just being mostly studio set although it does again give it that historical accuracy and like the production value but 
that production value isn't funny. Mm. It'd be fascinating. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it, it's astounding in many ways and, and memorable, especially the music, yeah. uh, as I say. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, you're right. It would actually be really interesting to see an entire parallel first series that is shot more like the second series. You know, so like every time he goes to see uh, his father, the king, you know, he, it's like in a, a small, a really cheap looking sort of court set, like in the same way that Queen Elizabeth is in the second series. You know? Yeah, I think it's one of those um, things where, you know, like it, it, it just p- pumping more money into something doesn't make it funnier. You know, it's like if the mm. script's funny and the performances are funny, you could do it in a cardboard box, you know, and it would be, it, it, you know, again, that Wizard of Oz example, like, there's nothing about the Wizard of Oz that, you like, you're the set design that takes me out of it, you know, it's because it, it's like, it, it, it's the same with comedy, like, you know, if it's uh, done just in a two shot, just two people talking, it's still as funny as it would be, you know, set and, you know, with, with much higher production value, it doesn't really need it. If the writing's there, then it's funny. Another bizarre thing that, uh, that they do in the middle, you know, I was talking about in some ways this feels like a truncated version of a much longer series. You have this thing where the resolution to uh, the uh, Queen of Spain's beard episode is that he ends up getting like arranged marriage, surprisingly arranged marriage to this girl. Yeah. You know, which obviously is very realistic for medieval times, you know, but like, uh, but but she sticks around. It's not like a one-off yeah. gag. It, she's in, there's only there's only two full episodes of the series yet to come. But she's in. She's certainly in the fifth one. I didn't expect that as well. I thought that you know that joke would be kind of just a one-off. You know they just I don't know what would they wouldn't even address that again. Yeah, just but package the, her off somewhere. You know, the, like the, it's just <laughs> there just to sort of taunt him even more. <laughs> just like sticking around. Yeah, the fact that he's married to this little girl and it's it's not even like she's a teenager that you might find unsuitably attractive or something. It's just she is just this little girl who's annoying and it, kind of sort of disappointment. Oh, you know, in the wedding ceremony. <laughs> Just one more thing. The yeah. bit that made me laugh out loud actually was actually probably one of my funniest moments is where he's reading <laughs> a bedtime story and I have to get to sleep. And then the little yeah. pig went <laughs> which was like you know, but you're so you know, he is quite hateable really. So, you know, there's there's uh, there's the moments of um moments of uh, failure like that are just you know you do find yourself laughing at him you know quite a lot you don't really yeah. like the character you know well this is the thing there are gems in the first series like the, the, his relationship with her however brief it is is pretty funny like you know when she shows up to visit him in prison when he's going to be burned as a witch and she's just childishly looking forward to the burning yeah, you know, she, just, yeah. she just hasn't connect believably hasn't connected it to anything human you know and it's kind of and, and you know you kind of like yeah that's that's pretty funny you know like that this, yeah 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 again you're seeing seeds yeah. of like longer longer running things they could have done yeah you know? that's a good that's a good joke you know there's there is there is good stuff in there i just i think a lot of it just just gets lost in these kind of elaborate plots that don't really need to and lots of as we said you know the, the lots of kind of like filming and you know like traveling from location it doesn't really need all that stuff mm. it's um it's almost like you know with the t- t- making the production bigger and and bolder it, it doesn't make it any funnier no i largely agree um so um I, i'd just like to talk a bit more specifically about um the finale episode uh the black seal which um which very is it's weird again with all these long running things, isn't it? This very easily could have been the end of Blackadder. Like this, this was this show was not considered a success. It was considered over budget. It was lukewarmly reviewed. Um, they very easily could have moved on to something else. I mean, it, obviously, if Ron Atkinson had decided to do something else, they presumably would have done. You know, um, this could be the end of it. And it's again this fascinating thing, isn't it? In a parallel universe, you know, this if this was all we had of Blackadder, how remembered would it be? Probably by Rowan Atkinson nerds a bit, you know. But what would his reputation even be like? Yeah, it certainly wouldn't be. I mean, when he went on to do, you know, Mr. Bean after this, you know, that would have been much more, you know, he certainly would have been remembered for that character more than Blackadder. Yeah, or he might have, you know, just gone back to doing theatre or something, you know, or, I, I, you know, who who knows? Um, it would be quite an oddity. Yeah, could have, could have been the end of the uh, film and TV career. But again, this, y- possibly. yeah, well, possibly, quite possibly, yeah. Um, the, the really weird thing about the Black Seal is, like I was talking before about the, the sort of, not inappropriate exactly, but kind of str- bizarre drama um, bookend to this series so this is the one where like because the show canonically takes place over i think is it about 13 years of this sort of alternate history even though there's only six episodes but you have this scene at the beginning of the black seal where he's he's almost like it's the final straw you know there's this big courtroom uh, proclamation where the king gifts like R- harry with almost every honor under the sun yeah um and with edmund he actually takes away one of his honors yeah. so <laughs> all he has now <laughs> you know is lord warden of the privy <laughs> you know um <laughs> So it, so he just loses it, and, and it's kind of it's almost like this um, unearned uh, accumulation because you know you've seen him have all these difficulties and humiliations, but it's only been going for like four episodes of the status quo. You know, it's kind of like, but he has this dramatic sting where he's like, "This shall not do." Yeah. <laughs> this like dramatic zoom. Um, oh, I should say that me doing that haphazard impression just now reminded me on my, on my watch last night. I realized the other thing which the first series of Blackadder is a bit like, and the other series are not like, is Count Duckula. 
Yeah, um, yeah. Which I'd not thought about at all. I'm not sure if it's deliberate at all, but it's 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 the idea of the aristocratic, um, bumbling idiot who takes credit for his more intelligent advisor's ideas. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, so when someone says something and he just repeats it and makes it his own idea, mm. and they say, "Very good, Lord," you know, it's like yeah. which they actually do. They do that joke in in Blackadder, don't they? Yeah, yeah and then obviously. Uh, following uh, Count Docula does it almost exactly the same. Yeah. I'd say Count Docula is almost like the more lovable version of Edmund. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which maybe maybe is why I like that as well, or, or maybe maybe it's the other way around. Um, but um, but yeah, so, so so you get this set up, and you, you know I mentioned before, like this this almost seems more like if you'd done Blackadder, and then you you for some reason came back with a Blackadder movie, like if you needed like a bigger concept. And because this this does that thing that movie spinoffs often do, isn't it? Where you you actually separate him from what's become his regular cast, and you kind of uh, you know he goes off on his own, and he meets this new cast of characters who are like you know obviously the whole episode's ripping on on the Magnificent Seven, um, you know, and he gets together this this posse of villains, you know, who are all ridiculous and you know quite amusingly introduced uh, to take on and overthrow the kingdom and, and you know achieve his his goal. Um, yeah, it's a weird weird piece of TV, this, isn't it? Yeah, it's um again most of the episode is taken up with that search, you know, and with those kind of scenes that are moderately funny, you know, but they're not like, you know, it's not it, it's not any amazing jokes that I can sort of that stick with me in it, you know, and it's like a lot of uh, it's a lot of setup. Yeah, and you're sort of traversing the grotesquerie of the English countryside, aren't you, in a way that you know, like maybe like a Terry Gilliam film would do, you know, it, it does it's again starting to feel a bit more python-esque or post-python in that sense you know? it's very post-python that's actually i didn't think of that comparison but yeah it does feel sort of like jabberwocky or like you know one of these like kind of low budget gilliam films where there's lots of lots of cold english settings lots of smoke you know lots of mm. um yeah nasty horror you know disgusting characters you know and and uh, not many not many laughs, <laughs> yeah no true and, and, and it's got that bizarre thing where you know the the, the old um the old sort of squire that he, he meets, uh, you know, only 15 minutes later or something turns out to be his, his like childhood nemesis, Philip of Burgundy that we've only just heard about, yeah. <laughs> which again, you know, you, again, you can see how that would be better if they'd seeded it for series, you know, like, you know, he'd kind of been mentioned many times before, you know, and it was setting, it was setting him up. Um, and he, well, I, one of the things I found weird as, as a kid and, and it's still find weird is, is the way he's played by the uh, narrator. Yeah, yeah, because the narrator is almost like the god of the series, isn't it? Like the god's voice. Yeah. So that that's a really strange choice, isn't it? It's almost like the narrator stepping in and be like, "No, I can be a better protagonist than you. I'm going to do this." <laughs> you know. Yeah, and I'm going to get rid of you. Like, yeah, this is a this is like the show eating itself, isn't it? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really bizarre, odd touch. Um, but he's you know he's 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 moderately amusing as well, playing it straight with that sort of grand voice. But, you know, there's that bit, I said I'd mention Rick Mail, but there's that bit where, uh, you know, Philip of Burgundy locks him in the dungeon and you have that sort of few minutes bit with, with Rick Mail playing Mad Gerald, which I think's, <laughs> I think's funny just because Rick Mail can't not be funny. Yeah, basically. yeah, that's, um, he's just got funny bones, hasn't he? He's just a funny guy. <laughs> but I'd actually forgotten, yeah. um, even though I just watched it recently, I'd, I'd, just, I'd forgotten that that was Rick Mail, yeah. And uh, that, that's, yeah, uh, yeah just, 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 just seeing Black Adam, <laughs> it almost feels sorry for him. In a way. Yeah, well, the bit where he, the the bit where he makes him laugh is it like you know a way out, a way out, and he just starts madly laughing, and, and then it cuts. Is it like you know eighteen months later or whatever, and he's just still laughing. Yeah, he's still laughing. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, again, these massive sort of jumps in time and stuff, and it, it just it's really really strange structure. Like you know, and like you said, introducing these characters that are so important to Edmund but have never been like you know introduced before. It's uh, it's very surreal, very strange. Yeah, it's so so odd, and you know, it, I think Rick Mail's a nice thing that helps it l- l- anchor to its eventual future a bit more, isn't it? You know, Rick Mail would obviously never be a regular, but he'd, he'd guest star on it memorably a few times. Um, Blackadder then goes back to the the court, you know, he escapes, and and um, you end up getting this thing where you know he 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 double crosses Philip, and then he's double crossed in turn, um, and is only you know the, the day is only saved, the, the status quo is preserved by um, by Percy and Baldrick poisoning the the, the, the Black Seal. Yeah. Um, you, you then get this horrible fate for Edmund, you know, which again, it's this thing of where I was just like, is this funny? I mean, it's kind of, it's more funny. It's it's portrayed more funny, but he, he's, he's trapped in this torture machine, basically. And you kind of like told all the horrible mutilating things that are about to happen to him, even even if there's some of them are kind of played for laugh, but not many. really. And then it happens. And then you kind of, and then it happens, yeah, <laughs> just off screen and you hear his reactions to it, you know, and it's, and it's just, it's just horrible. You know, it's, it's just horrible and nasty and... I'm not saying I don't like it but because maybe I'm I am a horrible nasty person. But I, I certainly as a kid I was fascinated by it. But I, um, it's just, it's just you from know, the writing perspective, you know. Like if you're having a writing round table and they're they're putting this down, like it, where's the joke? There's no joke there. You know, it's just it's just a morality tale, really, isn't it? It's just if you tr- try and do this, then you will 
get tortured and die. Like, it's really straight. You know, it's not, it's just really strange. If you're making a comedy show, why are you not playing it for, for any, there's any laughs, really? You know, especially in the final act, you know? It's like, yeah. you know, it's very strange. Well, this is, this is, I want to talk to you about this because this is, so the final scene of the show proper, really, you end up with, like, I mean, we'll talk about how it resolves in a second as well, but, like, the, your protagonist, however flawed he is, is on his deathbed with his hands cut off, <laughs> with his ears cut off, with, I think they imply that he's got no testicles now. Yes. So he's, li- so he's literally got, you know, as for a king, obviously that, a potential king, that's, that's an even more significant thing. You know, I think of something like Theon Greyjoy in uh, Game of Thrones, you know. Um, yeah, totally. But he's about to die. And, like, you know, even his brother can just say, you know, oh, you've got a pretty good chance of getting into heaven, you know, but like, yeah. you know, I'm not I'm not giving you any comfort more than that, yeah, you know. Yeah, um, but, um But, you know, and, and then it's, you know, they a good laugh actually is when they have Brian Blessed finally, you know, the running gag about him never getting his name right, always having like variants on it, like Edgar and Edith and yeah, stuff Edna. like that, you know, and he, yeah. he finally gets it right on his deathbed. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, well, that, that's like the, like the final insult, isn't it? You know, just when yeah. he could have had, you know, he's like, oh, it's a... It's uh yeah, it's just just awful. It's just awful. <laughs> yeah. But that ending's that ending. I, I do like that ending. You know, I like I like both the fact that you know Baldrick and Percy have, have accidentally poisoned the entire vat of wine, so everyone drinks to the the health of their dynasty. You know, on his deathbed, and they all die. And then he 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 just che- you know wonderfully idiotically he just checks if it was the wine and goes nope, perfectly all right to me. <laughs> that, that, now I shall be king of. <laughs> you know so you know he's king i think they they mention it in the second series uh end credits that they like you know his great grandfather was a king if, if although for only 30 seconds you know yeah 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 that's great <laughs> My chances are. Oh, good. Good. He will live. Hmm? Oh, no. Sorry, I thought you meant your chances of going to heaven. <laughs> Damn. Never fear, my son. Your body may be mutilated beyond recognition, but your spirit will live forever. My lords. What did you say? I give you Edgar. Poison the black seals, goblets, not poison the whole fat. Yeah. 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 What is it? The black dagger. Yeah. <laughs> May his name last as long as our dynasty. <laughs> I wonder if it was the wine. (laughs) No, seems perfectly all right to me. And now, at last, I shall be king of it. So, you know, it, it's, you know, later in Blackadder canon, you know, he, this guy did somehow have descendants, you know, illegitimate descendants, I guess, you know, but prior to this, you know, th- th- to carry on the line. But it's w- the only thing I want to say about that really is, is obviously it, it's it's written as if they're not going to do a second series. You know, it, 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 this is wrapped up, whatever else that they do. Um, you know, I said um, before that although the foretelling is, is fascinating, it's not really something that goes on to influence Blackadder. Like no other, every other Blackadder series starts with the status quo in place and you're just in it. You know, that's just, it's set up really economically and, you know, he just is an Elizabethan lord. He just is the butler to the Prince Regent. He just is on the front line of the First World War, you know, and and the, they get straight into it. This, this is more influential, I think, because Blackadder throughout it retains this um, tone of bleak finales, you know? Yeah, because every every series basically ends with the death of the entire cast. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, certainly the the the, the breaking at the very least the breaking up of the core dynamic. But but you, most of most of them do. The, the third series is a, is an exception, but it but even that kills the Prince Regent. Yeah, and 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 obviously leads to um they all have implications of uh, secret histories again, hidden histories, don't they? Because you know, in the, at the end of this one, the implication is that the history we now know Henry Shude is probably going to show up in a minute, like uh, Fort and Brass in at the end of Hamlet, you know, and 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 reestablish history as we know it. At the end of the second series, you get the implication that the Elizabethan dynasty will continue, but it's actually Hugh Laurie's character in disguise, you know. Yeah. Uh, similarly, at the end of the third series, you know that the the George the Fourth we now know will be Blackadder in disguise, you know. Um, and then I, I, I think, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but I think they cleverly riff on that at the end of the fourth series, even as they're about to do this memorable tragic finale, um, where they, they hint at the idea of a secret history in the sense that Darling has that crack about, you know, the Great War, 1914 to 1917. Yeah. You know, you, 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 it throws you, if you know anything about the dates of the First World War, it throws you for a minute, and, and then you realise it's a sick, dark joke about the fact that obviously they, they, are, they are all about to die. You know, That's, um, uh, you know, I mean, I know it's been said, but what a, what a memorable ending that is. It's just so well played, and like, you know, and, and, and just the tone, you know, of, of the whole thing just changes completely, but it doesn't change... It, it changes believably as well. It's really strange. Like the performances are just perfect, and then that whole slow motion out of the trench uh, fade into the poppies. It's just perfect. I mean, what mm. a way with with again with no budget, with a very small budget, you know, just to make something uh, dramatic like that. It's just so well done. What's interesting though, isn't it, is that um, Blackadder? I think partly because of its historical leaping of settings. You know, it, it it's it's almost like a prime sitcom archetype and uh, exemplar. But it's also like a mach- It's almost like a machine for destroying sitcoms. Like you feed sitcoms into it, yeah. and it destroys them for you. Yeah, <laughs> it shreds After them up. Loads of great material. Shreds them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It completely eliminates them by the end, and just just takes because you know, it destroys the situation yeah. as well as the characters. You know, well, I suppose the joke is with the end of the se- first series is that it's not a sitcom ending. That's that's what's funny yeah. about it is because it's not funny. <laughs> that's why it's funny. Yeah. It, well, it's like failure. It's almost like taking sitcom failure seriously, isn't it? Like like sitcom characters tend to fail over and over again. But in this world, that has consequences. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, the sitcom format is you can fail as much as you want and do ridiculous, violent, crazy things and no consequences. In this, we're going to show yeah. you what actually happens. <laughs> like, and that's the joke. Yeah. And what would happen if, and almost like what would happen if serious historical figures acted like sitcom characters? They would die because history is really horrible and violent. This is great, Dave, because what we've done is we've actually figured out uh, after sitting down for two hours why the first episode, <laughs> first series of Black Adder is funny. We've actually we've actually calculated. It's taken a while and a lot of thinking. It's yeah. taken about 27, 28 years, but we've, uh, yeah. we've 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 come up with an answer. Well, and I think also like why it's horrible and nasty, but why that actually becomes an enduring strain of Blackadder's D- DNA. Yeah, you know, like why that's that's also a useful thing to take into it. You know, like and it does take into it. You know, and and th- th- this is why I think the first series. It's not exactly a hidden gem, but I think for anyone who rhapsodizes over the the fourth series and it's and it's and goodbye you know it's finale and everything which is an enduring tv classic moment you know like i think some of it's in there from the start you know like some of the weirdness of it and the kind of the, the, the implications of of the historical setting and 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 the, as i say like the class struggle in it from the start it's 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 there in in acorn form you know it, it, it and and actually i'm saying acorn form fully realized you know this isn't this isn't a half-hearted ending no no, it's you know, it's it's not as it's not maybe as like emotionally resonant as the first World War ending, but it, it's 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 not like they did it by half measures. It's not like they crept up on it. You know? No, no. Well, that's yeah, that's for sure. That's that's part of the reason I think it's it's so shocking. You know, is because uh, it, it's kind of exactly what should happen, really, <laughs> in a weird way. Yeah, it just doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, and he kind of kind of deserves it. Kind of deserves it. Yeah, yeah. Well, to- yeah totally deserves it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That, that was that was an absolute pleasure to talk to you about that, Matt. Thank you. Um, I think we, um, you know, as as we mentioned off mic, you know, it, it was it was hard to not talk about the rest of Blackadder. Um, but I, I found it very interesting to focus as much as possible on the first series for for those reasons. And and uh, well, if we talked about the following series, it'd just be a list. I'd just be, you know, they're so quotable and like so enlarged in my memory. It'd just be a series of impressions, really, and no one wants to hear that shit. Yeah, well, it, it, it would have been yeah, just us rhapsodizing on how much we loved it, wouldn't yeah. it? Which you know, it's, it's also fun, but um, you know, it's, it's more interesting to talk about things that don't quite work. I think. Absolutely. Um, well, thanks for joining me, Matt. Um, you've um, you've had some stuff come out recently, haven't you? That you might want to plug. Do you want to let people know where you, what that was, where you can find yeah, it? Yeah, so we're carrying on with uh, Matt and Mike Paul Focus, uh, which is our sort of film rambling podcast. So you can find us on YouTube. Uh, subscribe. You can go on Twitter, Instagram. 
Uh, we've got a Facebook page, so please like and subscribe on all of those. Um, and we've got we've got Leon is coming out in uh, the next couple of weeks. Uh, after that, we're going to do a, for Halloween uh, and the approach to Halloween. We're going to do some horror recommendations of movies you can find on Amazon and uh, Netflix, etc. And then after that, uh, one of my favourite movies of all time, Alien Three. So uh, yeah, keep your keep your eyes on the prize. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that your new catchphrase? Yeah. yeah. Eyes on the prize. <laughs> Run that by Mike. It just tinkled me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Matt. Thanks for joining us. I really enjoyed that. That's great. Thank you, man. My pleasure. Thank you again for having me. And uh, let's do one again soon. Let's do that indeed. Thank you very much. See you soon. been listening to the escape goat podcast hosted by david blake fagiani if you want to contact the podcast with any feedback or thoughts you can leave comments on our lipson page or under our youtube videos or email us at escapegoatpod at gmail.com you can also reach the show on twitter on at egoat underscore pod and follow us for new episode notifications or get me personally on at db fagiani this podcast is available on youtube apple podcasts and spotify was our Lipsin site, scapegoatpodcast.lipsin.com. Original intro, outro, and any other incidental music for this podcast is composed, produced, and made available by permission of Richard Gilbert. 